What is going on guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live Stream. Today we are talking the Reef Moonshiner Method. Andre, how are you doing today? Alright, how are you? Wonderful, thank you. How are you doing? Cool. I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for, uh, for, uh, for having me here. It's uh, quite, uh, quite a uh, nice thing to be here online and uh, I don't know how many people are watching already but um, I basically shared the link in the um, in the Reef Moonshiners group, so a lot of my my followers and clients yep. and um, yeah students, Excellent. I would say, yep. almost uh, are here. So Excellent. I'm not, not I, alone so, yeah. I've been asked many times to get you on the stream, so yeah, it's been in the works for a while. You're gonna be the first one when I'm <laughs> when I'm ready, uh, and yeah, here we are. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So. That's pretty cool. All right. So you. So you run the Reef Moonshiners group, you have all your trace elements, and you do a lot of really good kind of articles and stuff on keeping a reef tank and kind of helping people improve it. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you're doing. So I know you do a lot on the mentoring side. Now, what, I guess for somebody brand new, how would you overarching describe the Reef Moonshiner method? So uh, I would say, first of all, the, um, the Reef Moonshiners method is actually something that um, I actually I actually started doing that just for myself mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years back when the uh, the ICP tests really hit the market, and uh, I was I was dosing um, trace elements even before the ICPs were really that popular, but it was always kind of a guessing game because you never knew how much of each of these minor trace elements are you kind of dosing, right? And um, that that changed significantly when the the ICP test came out, and that allowed me to to sort of start playing around with trace elements, uh, specific dosages um, and 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 products, and 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 there was there wasn't too many tests out there in the beginning that that allowed you to do something. So one thing that that always bugged me was that there was no no freedom really. Um, to do whatever you wanted, you know, you kind of, you, you tested the water, you had to use their products uh, to kind of do the corrections and or, or adjustments and uh, it kind of, it kind of wasn't really what I was after uh, because I wanted to do my own targets, I wanted to do my, my own stuff and uh, really experiment, you know, with, with all these elements. So that was one thing that I didn't really like in the, in the beginning and then uh, also um, it was expensive um, when yeah. uh, started doing the, the like 200, 300 gallon sized tanks. Gets adds up fast. <laughs> common brands out there, you, you buy these little you know uh, bottles, and they're gonna be like gunning with like two, three weeks, and then you're gonna have to buy the next one. So that was something what I didn't really like. And then I started to uh, one day I you know I just decided you know what. Uh, I'm going to re you know, reverse engineer all their, all their tools. So I made my own calculation tools, figured out how much uh, of these most big brands' uh, concentrations are, and started using their products. Mm -hmm. But with, uh, with my calculations and my tools, and you know, I verified it all with the ICPs. And uh, so I was able to, to uh, maintain my own levels. And then, well, the thing was still, it was too expensive personally for me for, for larger reef tanks and uh, to maintain these specific levels. So uh, at one point I just decided, you know what, uh, that's the full thing, I'm going to do even do the, uh, the elements uh, for, for myself as well. Mm -hmm. And well, well, if it was, you, you do sell a lot of corals, the, the tank grows, you sell a lot of wrecks, things get out of hand, get out of control, a lot of people come and see routinely your tank. So here in Houston, where we have really like a very big community of, of, of reefers, um, where people s basically started seeing, wow, you know, what, what the hell, what are you doing? You know, they started asking questions. What are the, all these bottles, you know, and things like this? And then uh, we started in, in, in town, basically, we start, I started to, to sell and hand out these bottles to like friends and buddies. And um, I remember a day when uh, one of the guys started, you know what, Andre, I want, you know, I, I'm going to need this, 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 this. I'm going to start with the full series here. And this is actually how it started. And uh, I said, yeah, just just take it. And, you you know, and uh, however, he left like a hundred dollar bill at my at my at my uh, at my table and uh, walked out. And then three weeks later, <laughs> they came back, you know, I need to refill it. You know, so he dropped these bottles and we refilled it. And uh, 
then uh, a few weeks later, the next guy came up. Yeah, you know, I heard from Mike, blah, 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 and this and this and this. And uh, it's kind of, it, it took off automatically without really doing anything for it. And mm -hmm. uh, at one point, I was at the, at the situation where I had like 20, 30, 40 people. And that was a point when uh, it, 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 it needed so much support mm -hmm. uh, to, to maintain the program that I started thinking about making it more user-friendly in terms of getting tools out, making instructions. You know, this is actually where how the handbook was born, yep. which most people that are on the method is, uh, they, they know uh, that they, uh, you know, when they, need, they need anything or they need to understand anything, you gotta look into a handbook and, you know, and look and see what's, what's, what's required there. Yeah, so. Uh, if that is how it kind of took on and mm -hmm. took off and how uh, the, the, the brand actually was born. Nice. Right. It's, uh, it's just, by now, it's uh, like after a couple of years, it's a, it's a small business. I operate on my own, and everything is uh, done, made in the USA proudly. Nice. So, um, yeah, this is uh, how it uh, started. No, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, so, uh, yeah, basically the biggest question is what most people have is really how to apply it. Mm -hmm. Uh, to my surprise, there are barely any people who really want to understand how it works. It's more like, you know, hey, I saw the tank, I know it works, you know, I've seen so many people <laughs> talking about it, tell me how to do it and just let me know what I, what I need to do here. And it, it's, it, that is basically what, what, what people are after mostly. Uh, majority of people don't really are not really interested in uh, what does it do and how it really works in the coral and you know, what does it you know in particular does on 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 the on the, uh, on the organisms. So I, I find trace elements can really change colors of corals, especially you know if you under overdose, it can completely change it. So so I find it interesting to slowly learn you know which one does what to your tank. Yeah, that that is that was one aspect where I was in the early days. I started. Um, kind of testing out what does each element really do to the coral and is it really like some of these myths that are out there you know you put potassium in and it does that and you put manganese in there and it does this you put rubidium in there and you know it, each element does a certain thing mm -hmm. um, well the ugly truth is that um, the entire trace element and water chemistry is is in my opinion uh, depending on on limitations. Yeah. But there are there are it's like Liebig's law, law of limits. Mm -hmm. If if you have uh, certain things are completely depleted and missing, mm -hmm. you will never see the benefits of uh, really like uh, what what the coral could look like when you when you when you uh, when you when you're running out of traces. So yeah. that kind of, um, in the past, of past years, we, we started doing kind of a, a light version where we said, you know what, we just don't want to start big. You know, hobby is already expensive, so we start with uh, just a, a very limited amount of elements and um, that didn't work very well. So we, there was a, a, a light method, which we called the light method in the beginning with a very uh, small amount of, of users, Moonshiner users. And we figured out at the end, you know what, you, you got to do, tackle the whole thing or it won't show any, or mostly not show any effects at all. So it was an experience we did. So hmm. uh, I tried many, many, many elements like in lower levels, higher levels, different ranges. And what I found out honestly is that you cannot really tweak specific coral, you know, coloration in corals with specific elements. Mm. Yes, there are certain elements that do protect the coral from like sun bleach or, or light bleaching, um, but at the end, you you need to have to you have to look at all of these trace elements, and um, in order really to see the effects of of your higher system. And you cannot say, okay, I'm going to put potassium up. And my corals become more bluish or more reddish or more pinkish. That is, um, that is so from my experience, really, uh, the fine tuning is done when you have all your chemistry sort of managed and, and you know, in, in place. Then your light spectrum allows you a little bit to play around with, with your coloration. For example, a lot of people ask me, hey, how do you maintain more pinkish coloration? Uh, coloration? Mm -hmm. And I notice is when you have um, like these modern uh, light fixtures, they do allow you to play around with the UV, or UV setting. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, if, a, if you tune up a little bit your UV setting, 
it gives it seems to really enhance more the pinks in in uh, in, in most acroporas and <laughs> most corals. Uh, however, if you tweak it too high, right, or you reach or over you know oversaturate your corals with light with light energy, then you're going to have an adverse effect, and you know pfft, corals go down the drain. That is then just <laughs> so it's a line. Yeah. So it's always a, a you know a lower and a in a higher threshold where you where you kind of work in within so um to to bring it to the point i you know to tweak specific coloration and specific corals the only thing what i really could trust so far is iron mm -hmm. um, if you dose more iron uh, then you can basically shift the true yellow coral into more like a greenish and then i personally know that <laughs> Kind of okay. That's that's already too much iron, so you need to dose a little bit less every day, and um, then you're kind of getting, you know, having a a, a good yellow color, mm -hmm. a good green color, and also you typically going to be good enough on your iron level to support other microorganisms, yep. because these trace elements are not just there for for your coral coloration, they also support your bacteria biology and your microfauna. Mm -hmm. uh, all the sponges and you know, and all this, all the little critters in your tank, uh, they know they also need uh, trace elements, and most people don't even know it or never heard about it. And it's yeah, yeah, it's um, no, okay. So, question from the chat I'm gonna guess the answer is a yes, but ask Andre if he's do dosing the daily traces such as iron, chromium, and magazines, etc. Okay, you know what? Maybe what we're gonna do is in order to get uh, all the people that are not familiar with the method, uh, yep. let's just, if you can uh, put uh, the, um, the how it works uh, page on the screen for the people. And I'm just gonna walk through uh, quickly how the method really works. Okay. And, um, so basically what, what we do is we, uh, we start with an ICP uh, and it's going to be the ATI ICP because this is where all the, the calculation tools, the ICP assessment tools, everything is written around the ATI test. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the big benefit of the ATI test is actually that you're gonna have your water parameters tested, uh, but also it tests your RODI water. And that I found out is something where a lot of people, they're gonna run into issues when they're starting doing it the first time, they are very surprised that they do have issues on their RODI system. Even if you have like zero TDS, uh, you could have tons of silicates in your in your in your tank water that fuels diatoms and uh, dino or whatever. So a lot of problems you can have on your tank because of yeah, you have too much crap going in your in your in your in your top of water. Mm -hmm. And um, when when people say, but yeah, but I still have zero TDS. Why do I have dirt in my RODI water? Uh, the, the answer is actually the TDS meter only detects at a certain uh, point, right? Yep. Until it measures enough uh, solids in the water and then it switches to like one TDS. And that means typically it's 500 microgram. And people that are longer on the method, they know that in order to have, when you have 500 microgram of dirt in your RODI water, that is really, really a lot. So uh, it's, it's quite, quite, quite a lot of stuff. So. Uh, you do your ATI uh, test, and you typically do it like every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Um, the more or the longer you are on the method, the less testing you typically do, and you can skip a test here and there. Um, and that's basically how you start with. Okay. And, um, now, yeah, just throwing this out there for other people too, the handbook and assessment tool, all this is free on the website, and there's a pack full of ton of good information. So if you've never yeah. looked at it, it is 100% worth reading through it because there's a ton of great reefing advice just reading through it. Yeah, um, what, what, I, what I typically advise before doing anything, you just go to the website and you, you, uh, you download the handbook, you just start reading the handbook. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, a few months ago, I started, uh, or I did upload actually a new a new website, reefmoonshiners.com, yep. and you go to handbook and tools tab, and where you find a direct download. So you can basically download and opening up the handbook, and even the ICP assessment tool right from the website. 
Mm-hmm. That's really convenient, easy. Yeah. Uh, other than that, you're going to find also on the uh, on the web store where I do offer my products. You're going to find uh, all the electronic tools there as well. They are kind of you, you just check them out for free. You purchase them, put them in your cart. You say purchase, and you don't have to pay anything. You can just immediately download them. Um, since I have a website up officially, I had to have a place now where I can put publications out where I can put, you know, data out and, and, and tools and stuff like this. So that, that helps a little bit to uh, yeah, speed up the process, make it easier for people to get the stuff. So first advice is read the handbook. That yep. is really what it's all about. And if you, uh, if, you, if you read the handbook, maybe one or two times, and you get the tools in, and you follow the right directions, you will be able to, on your own, manage your whole entire chemistry uh, without even asking me. And that was actually the reason why, uh, why I developed these tools and uh, threw them out that everyone really can work completely independent and don't have to ask any questions, don't need really support. Um, when, I, when I developed the, the method over the years, um, I worked a lot with my, with my followers. Mm-hmm. So and I was really, really listening to what their needs are, what their questions are, and I was always open for, for recommendations, what what to do and how to do it, and make it easier for everyone to use, because there is a wide spectrum of people and edu- you know educational level. Some yep. people are very familiar with math and chemistry. Some people have no clue about it. For them, it's a complete new world. So, Reef Moonshiner's handbook and assessment tool is is pretty good. And, it um, is. Is, it is also very easy written, um, mm-hmm. since I'm not really an, uh, a native a native English speaker. Um, I, I, <laughs> I'm pretty easy, right? So I, I don't really have a very exotic uh, vocabulary, you know, which I can choose from. And I typically prefer that my audience mm-hmm. does understand what I'm talking about. So my goal is the more they understand, the easier I make it for them. You know, the the better uh, the results are, and the, the less they buck me at the end. So, and the, the, the least support they need. Yep. And uh, that's that's really the uh, what was the goal basically. The goal was read the handbook. You know where to find stuff, and uh, you shouldn't have really any questions afterwards. Uh, yes, there are people. You know, we're living in a, in a very hectic and in a fast fast moving on world. So there is uh, always people that just just screen through the book. So sometimes I get people saying, hey, Andre, I have a question. I read the handbook uh, and I check it and I see, you know, okay, you have the handbook for five minutes. You can't read like a 40 page long <laughs> handbook in five minutes. So I said, well, how's that? You go back, read the handbook, and if you still have a question, you know, ask me. So I do that too. I'm like, here's a link to a video on that. Watch this, then ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, yeah. So basically, you start reading the handbook and mm-hmm. then you, you perform the test, the ATI test. And then it's pretty easy. You go forward and take after like two weeks, typically one to two weeks, it depends a little bit. You're going to get your test results back. And all you do is you take these test results and you manually enter these test results in that so called ICP assessment tool. Mm-hmm. And what that tool does, it, it, it tells you, uh, it gives you a comment on your current level. Um, so it's kind of as I would personally sit there and would give an, a kind of an analysis of your ICP results. Yeah. So depending on what you enter, uh, it's going to be too high, too low. It also warns you kind of saying, hey, your copper level is detected. It shouldn't be that the case, but it's so low you don't have to worry about. Just wait for the next test to uh, see how copper is going to develop. Yeah. So that type of thing. Um, a lot of other uh, comments are uh, you know, on each element, actually. Mm-hmm. And it also gives you a, a very precise dosing recommendation for each of these elements yep. by using uh, either the, the Brightwell uh, major major elements, which is, uh, I, I personally uh, use the uh, calcium, mm-hmm. the magnesium, and uh, also strontium, potassium. But I strongly recommend uh, the, the Brightwell products. And these tools do really support a specific mixing recipe um, and their products. So you basically you can you can easily do all that stuff basically at home uh, by by doing it on your own with using their powders, which is basically the cheapest option you know, on the market so far. And Brightwell uh, turned out to be one of the most, for me personally, even one of the most reliable products on the market. 
mm-hmm. uh, as, at least for the ones I do recommend. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people ask me, hey, are you, are you getting sponsored by Brightwell or ATI or anything? So I tell you the truth, uh, my goal was always, I'm not keeping my mouth shut. I talk, you know, I, I will not be purchased by or bought by anyone. So I, I do not have any affiliations, no sponsorship or anything with any of the companies. If I personally do recommend a product, it's because I used it, I have really good results with it, and I'm, I'm, I'm behind using that product. Um, that doesn't mean that there are other products out there that might be you know, equal or, or better. It's just this product was so reliable over the, the decades for me that I, I, I feel very good about it to, to provide this product to my, to, my, to my clients and tell them, hey, use that, uh, you can't go wrong with it. Yep. That's the, the, the mission behind it. So, um, so yeah, this tool tells you com- or gives you comments. It tells you for each element how to dose it and how much to dose it. Mm-hmm. It also will give you, which was something what some of us, what the clients asked for, was to give a dosing summary at the end again. It's yep. kind of a pager where everything is, you know, kind of condensed. Here's everything you need. <laughs> yeah. So that's the one you print out and, you know, pin on your wall so you know what to do for the next four weeks. And also it has a I dosing. Put, I put little uh, stickers on all the bottles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So also it has a, a first time shopping list. Mm-hmm. Um, some people had some difficulties too when they calculated the overall dosing. They didn't know how much really uh, to purchase on the bottles, on the, on the Moonshiner products. Mm-hmm. So one, I, one guy came up with the idea, hey, why you just put in a, a shopping list in there? You have all the data in there. And I was like, yeah, you know what? It's a great idea. So uh, when the ICP assessment was done, uh, the tool was released, I put basically the shopping list on the very bottom of it, so it get, gives people a kind of an idea, especially on larger tanks, like 200, 300 gallons, mm-hmm. uh, how much they really need in order to get to the first, first correction. Right? Oh, oh yeah, I, I remember when I first did it and all, to get everything back in line, it was a good chunk of stuff you're dosing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people are a little bit scared when they when they run through the uh, dosing summaries. They do mm-hmm. see some elements are dosed much more and on liquid than some of the others. Uh, the the daily elements mm-hmm. um, uh, we talk about in a second about it. Daily elements are like 0.1 milliliters versus boron on fluoride. Right? You dose like 40, 50 milliliters a per correction. Yeah, right? so just. Uh- Oh, my tank, 0.15, 0.15, yeah, 0.07, 0.8. Yeah, these are, these are the daily elements, and, and you dose them intentionally on a daily basis. Now, the, I guess one question. If dosing it, say, once a week versus dosing it smaller daily, is there a big benefit to the corals that happens to have it every day or yes, versus weekly? Is. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, you, um, w- one thing is with this method... I would like to mention that you, you're not required to do water changes anymore. Um, some people kind of have a misconception about it. They say, oh, you don't have to do water change, or I'm not supposed to do water changes. No, you can do your water change. If you want to do your water changes, do your water changes, but you don't really have to because whatever trace elements a new you know, a water change would bring you is being taken care of by the monthly correction on these, on these major elements. Mm-hmm. And these are the ones that do slowly deplete over time. Yeah. Like bromine, boron, fluoride. These elements are, they deplete or they will be consumed or oxidized actually uh, very slowly over time. So, and the moonshiner levels are set to a level above natural seawater level that in these four weeks, mm-hmm. they will slowly go down, but they will never reach really a point where that normally on a normal tank, they would never really get to the point where they would kind of cause a depletion level or would mm-hmm. end up level so we're always sufficiently there by that um i have a random question you, you yeah. said some of the elements can be oxidized out would running yeah. ozone remove some of the elements well every element what we what we kind of dose mm-hmm. or supplement in our tanks runs in seawater which is uh, very oxidative yeah. uh, it runs through um a sequence of reactions it sort of degrades into different levels um, some levels are um, like the, the, at the beginning. It's, they try to be very, very simple here. Some level, some some elements are bioavailable at some point. That means organisms can take them up. 
Mm-hmm. And then they run into uh, into into by by oxidation, they kind of run into into like a status where they are not bioavailable anymore, or even become toxic if they accumulate and they going to change to certain certain oxidation stages. They even can be can be toxic. So that's, that's a, that doesn't count for all these elements. Um, and there's also a lot of chemical reactions going on in the tank. It really, really blow, would blow the whole night to, to go through all of that. Uh, but the more or the higher oxidation level you have in your water, the mm-hmm. faster some of these elements mm-hmm. kind of oxidize. Um, yep. Iron, for example, is one of these guys, unfortunately, or iodine. Iodine, for, yeah, but iodine is a perfect example. The handbook has a whole dedicated page, right? And yep. it's simply said iodine, it started as iodide, mm-hmm. which is put in. Nobody really knows if it's useful or not, but in my opinion, it, it, it is sort of useful. I've uh, never fully known the difference between like iodide, iodine, and all the. Okay. Actually, when you read the handbook, you kind of get the info for it. I read it, so but I, I got to read it again, have, apparently. <laughs> you have an iodide, yep. and it oxidizes into iodine. Mm hmm. And then into iodate. Yeah. So iodate is, you know, useless. We there's nothing known really where it could be could be useful. It's kind of at the end of a chain. And when it's iodine mm-hmm. for a while, right? Because it, it it kind of depends how much iodide is available. And then it turns into iodide. Uh, iodine. So did I do it right? So it's iod- iodide. It turns into iodine. Right, and yeah. then it's bioavailable. Your corals will take it up, and and o- small organism, microfauna, everybody is going to use it. It's going to be there for a while, and then it oxidizes into iodate. And then it's un- it's useless. We don't need that anymore. So the reef moonshiners method uh, is 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 in such a way done that, due to the dynamic of iodine in the seawater, it 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 goes up and down really really fast depending on how, how strong your oxidation level is in your water. And that means that how much ozone you put in, how much carbon you put in, which takes it all away as well, and how much aeration you have, your first skimmer, the quality of your oxygen level that your skimmer puts in. All these things, your agitation on your surface, your mm. wave makers, all these things are making the iodine dosage so unpredictable. And this is why it's recommended to start do the dosing like every day, a couple of drops. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to look at the end of the month, you look what your iodine level are, basically based on the test. Yep. And if it's too low, you're going to put some more drops in. Mm-hmm. Next month, you're going to look again or say, oh, I'm pretty close. I'm, I'm at 60 now. So you're going to put in three, four more drops in per 100 gallon. And you kind of do it uh, from test to test until you're going to be around a healthy iodine level where we want to be yep. and then you're gonna basically you're going to keep that daily daily drops uh, per day and you maintain your iodine no matter what you're going to be pretty good what people sometimes do they get nervous or now i feel like oh my iodine is too low don't really understand the dynamic of iodine and then they just do a simple correction dose and that typically ends up that you shoot over uh, all that massive amount of iodide turns into iodine suddenly, right? Mm-hmm. And then two weeks later, it's all it's okay. going to go down and it stays low and it, it doesn't really help. So iodine, really, you have to be patient and you have to work yourself from test to test. And as soon as you're there, uh, even like small skimmer changes, um, new skimmers, uh, new filter media, uh, different settings on your pump, the impact on the iodine level at the end from month to month is so small and you still do, if it's getting too high, it crawls slowly up. Mm-hmm. You, can, you, you do kind of sort of adjust it then yeah. from, from month to month and you're gonna be, you're gonna be good. And iodine is really one of the most influencing um, elements in, in our reef. And if this is why it's so, so important. And uh, the way the Moonshiner uh, method does it, uh, and even people who are not on the method, they can just replicate it by reading the handbook, using their own stuff, using their own tests. They kind of can replicate it even without being really like a, a real reef Moonshiner user. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's nice. Uh, even in other countries, specifically where the Moonshiner is not available. Yeah. Uh, so iron is really one of the key elements you really have to look out for. Now, it's, it's, is that something you think most people should be dosing daily? Uh, yeah, so 
um, like I said, all the major elements that slowly deplete over time, uh, they're going to be corrected once a month, every six mm-hmm. weeks, right? And some some people kind of wanted to bring even more stability in. They're going to take their corrections between the months and they're going to spread it out and put it in like on, on a daily basis in there as well. Brings an additional level of stability. In my opinion, I, I didn't really see the need for that. Mm-hmm. And since we all have a life, you know, family, you know, and, and work. It's, the method is pretty much solid, but you can go along very well with on a monthly basis doing your corrections and you're going to be good. Yep. I mean, there are some, some when people are longer on the method, they're going to see certain elements are always on zero at the end of a month. There are some 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 situations where I would say, okay, after like three four months, you you now familiar with a method. Now what you can do is, in order to keep your zinc and nickel levels up a little bit, because these two are really important as well, or very beneficial at least. I do recommend then to kind of start dosing these as well if it, it's not too inconvenient. Because what you do is you have four daily elements that you dose, which is manganese chromium iron and cobalt these yep. are the, the called the dailies and we do them on a daily basis and um, the basically the reason why we do them basically daily is they they do oxidize or getting consumed very quickly mm-hmm. um, if you do a water change man- manganese and with a good salt manganese chromium cobalt you will find them you know two days later uh, with some salts. Most salts, they are all gone within one to three days. Not detectable anymore. They're not gone really. They are just uh, below the detection levels of the ICPs. And unfortunately, our day, our current ICPs, they do not allow us to look what is between truly zero mm-hmm. and, and one microgram per liter. Um, maybe in f- soon future, we're going to have ICP machines that can really detect in that range you know, more precisely. But until we are aware, it's kind of a kind of a guessing game where they are when you when your test detects them as zero. So, well, we do we do dose them daily because you need these four elements really on a daily basis, in very very small amounts only. Mm-hmm. Um, if any of these ones become detectable, they are already too high. Yeah, we don't want that because like some of these metals are are um, causing that your fluorescence goes goes away like cobalt for example if cobalt is detectable it typically makes your fluorescence of your corals uh uh yeah less <laughs> and um, if you have a truly depleted cobalt level you also have barely any fluorescence you need a little bit so so too I, much you get bad fluorescence yeah. and what, I, what i've done enough, is I've done tons of research and tons of testing to find um on average because everything is a little bit different to find the, the the best the best amount of uh, of cobalt and chromium and iron to start with, mm-hmm. and that is basically what the, what the people are instructed to do. They have in the handbook or in the, in the dosing assessments, they're going to have uh, one value of um, how much liquid they need to dose for their particular tank of these elements, these four, and uh, they just do that. And if they have like macroalgae or tons of corals, they can do double the, the daily dosage. And uh, if you have like a huge refugium and a huge tank with tons of coral, like overgrown like crazy, like my old 300, for example, I, at that point I started even doing like triple the daily dosage. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was well, it was taking care of it. And as soon as yeah. you see if, you know what, my I, I'm losing my green fluorescence a little bit and the corals start looking a little bit dull, it might be that you're kind of doing too much of the, uh, like specifically cobalt and chromium. Um, and then you just go back to what, what Andre said, what the tool said, and then you, after it takes a few weeks, then you're going to see your results. And, and in most cases, it get, gets been back to the fluorescence level where it was before. Yep. So uh, then, yeah, you have these four dailies. And then, of course, if, if iodine is uh, too low, you're going to have to do the iodine as well on a daily basis, which is then the fifth element. There is also a lot of times that in many tanks you need vanadium. Mm-hmm. Vanadium, if depends really what system you run for your alkalinity and 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 calcium supplementation and manganese, uh, yeah, magnesium uh, supplementation. A lot of these two parts and 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 
supplements they do have a little bit of vanadium in there already by default so many tanks i do see they don't really need vanadium mm -hmm. uh, but when you're not doing water changes anymore and you you basically supplement very pure alkalinity calcium and magnesium supplements then you run out of vanadium pretty quick and then you have to do something and then you basically do the similar thing a similar or same method as with, with iodine you you dose a certain amount of drops per day mm -hmm. and um, you look from test to test and you adjust your vanadium uh, daily supplement until you have your your perfect your perfect value yeah. so okay so there's a question in the chat about the different depletion based on different dosing systems, like calcium reactors versus like a two-part, for instance, or I mean like a Kelquasser. Like, is there, I know something like ESV has a bunch of trace elements in it, so you'll likely need to do yeah. supplement less. Yeah. Where yeah. a calcium reactor, you're not going to have that full addition of trace elements. So it, it is for sure a difference, but what's yeah. your, have you noticed a big difference with different dosing systems? Well, what I personally like and prefer is um, I, I use the bright well alkaline mm -hmm. calcium and magnesium products because they are the purest one and I do the, the classic old school balling method uh, the old school balling method is actually you dose these three elements as needed individually mm -hmm. And you don't do like, oh, I, I dose the same part, uh, alkalinity equal to calcium. No. If you need alkalinity, you dose alkalinity. If you need calcium, you, need, you dose uh, calcium. And you adjust these three individually um, to, to match the, the tank consumptions. Because I, I'm not really a big fan of two parts, because in my opinion, it's, it's just an industry made up thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, every tank and every organism and every coral actually, and it's proven now as well, uh, multiple times, do or does consume these three major components in, in, in with a different uptake. So mm -hmm. at the end, uh, there's also bacteria. Depends on how you manage your bacteria biology and your nutrients. Um, if you if you do a lot of carbohydrates, means you you maintain a higher amount of bacteria. Mm -hmm. Bacteria need alkalinity. They need bicarbonate and carbonate. So, if you if you dose a lot of carbohydrates, you're going to have a lot of bacteria and you have a lot of alkalinity consumption. A lot of people that dose uh, two parts in equal amounts will run into situation that they say, "Man, I'm dosing and dosing and dosing. My calcium gets higher and higher and higher, and my my alkalinity stays barely where it is." And that is basically because. You know, you, 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 you can't really do an equal part for all of that in, in most tanks. In some tanks, it kind of works for a while. You do small corrections here and then, then yeah, you're good. Mm -hmm. So, I personally prefer the, 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 the pure supplementation of these three elements. So, if we're talking about, um, like, calcium reactor, um, I... Unfortunately, I had to tear down my calcium reactor because reborn from two little fishies mm -hmm. was really available anymore, as as we as most of us you know know it. And I was always happy, very happy with it because it had a natural amount of trace elements that are built in into the corals and these fossilized corals that basically was released back to the water. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that was okay, you know, and I did never really had an issue. I always had to do my moonshiners because whatever was dissolved was natural seawater built. Yeah, that was is of course lower than what I do with my reef moonshiners method. Mm -hmm. So I always had to dose a little bit of these elements, and that was well, that was okay. Uh, and this this particular media helped to reduce the amount of corrections every month. So now when I started using other uh, uh, media, you know, which are based on, on limestone, uh, crushed limestone, I noticed, and I went through like three, four different brands, and then I gave up, um, I always had issues where either like bromine, barium, something always creeped up slowly. Mm -hmm. And that is basically because it's, it's, it's fossilized rocks, right? It's, it's a sediment that turns into this limestone at the end and depends on where on this, on this planet has been harvested, the quality and the contents in that limestone is is basically yeah saturated with, with impurities, which yeah. are trace elements as well, but 
they're all they're all different, right? And you mm. never know what you're going into. Uh, so, one media had like, my barium creeped up above hundred, and I said, yeah, yeah, this is not working. And changed to the next one, right? After a mm-hmm. huge water change, measured everything, ICP did it again, and I tried. Like I said, three, three or four media I tried, even the new two little fishies, but it yeah. had so much shells in there and little dirt and the performance of the reactor wasn't really that well anymore uh, that I said, you know what, uh, I'm going to go back to, to, to simple dosing. The reason yeah. I did that is on one end, um, there are a lot of newbies that mm-hmm. do start on fresh tanks and smaller tanks. They're going to do dosing, right, by yeah. default. Because it's something what what works and it's it's not as expensive at, at least it doesn't appear as expensive and um, and it's it's kind of the right way to start a tank with because at the beginning you have not enough consumptions on, on alkalinity and calcium in order to, to operate a calcium reactor mm-hmm. so you're better off with a dosing system so I personally thought like you know what so, so many people like hundreds of people are really looking into uh, and ask me questions about dosing systems and how to do it and all that kind of stuff I looked up the old websites where Berlin was, or Berlin was explained, right? And you, I couldn't find any more any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to start doing the, uh, the classic Berlin method, the dosing individually. And at one point, I'm going to make a nice YouTube video on my Reef Mushanas channel. And uh, here we go. Now that helps people, and I can mentor like hundreds and thousands of people all at the same time the way I do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it works. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that covers basically my my concern with calcium reactors right now. And I do have one GO1218 yep. in the garage just sitting there, another GO818. Yes, you know, these, I think that's these what I have. are pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah. And they're just sitting there and, and, and you know, collecting dust. Really, really sad. So I, I hope at one point the, uh, the, the reborn media or very something very, very similar could come back on the market. But... It doesn't look that good at the moment. Yeah. So let's, Hopefully. let's hope for the best. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, Kalkwasser. Um, well, <laughs> Kalkwasser, first of all, there are different Kalkwasser brands out there. Some mm-hmm. of the Kalkwasser brands, I personally use Kalk Plus from Brightwell yep. in the past, and it has a lot of trace elements in there, in addition to the, uh, to the hydroxide, calcium hydroxide. Mm-hmm. I personally do not like calc washer um, on on a longer period of time the reason of that for that is actually uh, the calcium hydroxide as soon you're going to start dosing it first of all you need to have a really really circulating reactor yeah. i don't really like when people you know putting the sludge into this top of containers and so that is that's, that's already a, a problem on its own but uh Anyways, you, you, you do the method with calc, with calc mm-hmm. and it brings your pH up, of course, right, because yep. of the hydroxide. And one thing is what I don't like on calc water systems is over time you see a lot of residue all over the tank. Mm. You see like precipitation after a year, one and a half years, all over the place. You see a lot of this precipitation going on and it's very common. Every calc water guy you would talk to will experience the same thing. Uh, what what it did, what it does actually this precipitation is uh, calcium carbonates and unfortunately uh, phosphates. Hmm. So if you go with calcwasser, you're gonna have to stick with calcwasser because if you're gonna ever stop doing it and you go to a calcium reactor, for example, all the PO4, the precipitation will start to dissolve. And it will hmm. go back to the tank, and you're going to you're going to troubleshoot your tank with high interesting for for quite a while. Because I'm then, using uh, both at the moment. So I got the calcium reactor, and I'm doing just a calc to this sample vent just for the pH purposes. Well, but. in theory, in theory, that sh- that shouldn't. I don't know. Maybe maybe it does. I I don't know. I'll um, find out long term. <laughs> the thing is, I was constantly uh, cleaning up my pumps, my pipes, you know, equipment, mm-hmm. collect the precipitation all the time. Uh, it was dirty by by saying that um, if you if you're changing from a calcwasser system after years to a calcium reactor, you're gonna oh it's nice everything is so clean you know it's so easy to maintain uh, it's really nice um, yeah but calcium reactor has its own problems mm-hmm. so and then another thing what I personally don't like and it's 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 hard to find any evidence for it to be honest but um, you're going to have um, a, a massive chemical reaction 
on your seawater buffer system. In our basin, most people don't even understand really fully the uh, alkalinity in a reef tank. Uh, and it's a very, very complex subject. And the industry really uh, plays it really basically down to, uh, oh, it's just alkalinity. Now, alkalinity is the most complex subject in, in, the, reef, in the reef chemistry. And there are so many influencing, influencing factors on that. One is uh, CO2, um, your oxygen level, your carbonate and bicarbonates. Uh, mm -hmm. Which are which are always driven by um, a ratio and equilibrium uh, in the seawater, and with with so with calcium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, or any other hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. First of all, these things are really really bad, mm -hmm. um, dangerous. Um, however, if you in, in influence them in the water, they're going to cause a massive amount of chemical reaction in your equilibrium, and that shifts the carbonate bicarbonate ratio out of the normal seawater range um, and I probably have to do you know with some some explanation do a video uh, in, in few in soon future about this but explains it a little bit more however that reaction causes actually that your pH goes up so high mm -hmm. and um, I, I do see uh, when I talk to uh, a very good bio marine biologist um, who who who, who Whose his job is basically the carbon cycle in the, in, the, in the natural reef environment, and he was trying to explain me that after I, I studied on, on Cambridge University for quite a few weeks, the, you know the, the carbon buffer system. Um, it is it, it's such a dramatic and a massive amount of chemical reaction that's taking place on this carbonate bicarbonate ratio, similar to, similar to what we experience when we do have an alk swing. Mm -hmm. so, Hmm. Is when you have too much, you know, too much soda ash, too much, uh, uh, um, yeah, baking soda, one or the other. If you have too much in there and you're going to cause an alkalinity swing, this ratio on carbonate bicarbonate and 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 all of that, it, it's changing its ratio, yep. and that's what the alkalinity swing does. You can basically introduce the same reaction with using uh, hydroxides. hydroxides. They, yeah. they do a, they're causing a similar thing. Um, normally, it shouldn't really cause the long-term effects as we see it with alkalinity swings. You know what's going to happen? We're going to have STN, RTN, and all these bad things going to happen if you do it too many times right after each other. Well, if a healthy tank can take it once. Mm -hmm. Second time you have already, eh, it's going to be it's going to be critical. A third time within a short short period of time, you're going to lose corals for sure. Yeah. So I'm uh, a good pH to achieve is very easy by just take sodium sodium hydroxide, right, dosing in your tank, mm -hmm. and uh, maintain your alkalinity with it, even if it's a very dangerous uh, uh, chemical. Yeah. But when when you do that you run into the situation that you do may going to kill some of your corals a lot of people do that partially they mix numerous things all together and run them along with each other mm -hmm. but i personally would not do that um i was i was running very low ph uh, for quite a while mm -hmm. and um well, you know I took these, these studies with cambridge to really understand the carbon cycle much better Went, came, you know, went back to my reef tank, uh, started dosing at basically alkaline 8.3, which is a very natural mix of carbonates and bicarbonates along with a little bit of boron. Dosed it for a while, and then my 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 pH just shot through the roof. And right now, I'm thinking about to put a CO2 reactor on my tank in order to bring my <laughs> my pH down. Got yeah, was 8.5 during the day, and it months before you know a few months before I had I was struggling with always low pH, and you know low pH is, is triggering a lot of TN issues potentially and brings in other problems. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and maintaining a good alkalinity carbonate by carbonate ratio in your in your seawater buffer system that is really a key to to healthy good growing corals and it's uh, a lot of underestimate it's, it's underestimated by a lot of people now when you but, uh, when you say carbonate bicarbonate are you mixing the two together in your alkalinity well, supplement here's the thing there is a natural ratio of roughly 90 percent bicarbonate mm -hmm. Know, and and 10% carbonate, and then one percent is, is is other stuff that builds your total alkalinity. So um, when people dose like either soda ash, 
or, or baking soda, they do one or the other. Mm -hmm. And that is causing as well a, a, a massive amount of chemical reaction because what's happening is if you take soda ash, it basically goes, it gets into the water, it takes the CO2 out, the uh, this dissolved CO2 yep. takes it out in order and, and it builds a new equilibri equi equilibrium. Equilibrium, and, uh, yeah. Yep. And then um, you know you you, may, you maintains automatically a higher pH because the soda ash, in order to get to that ratio, that natural ratio, it needs that CO2. So it, it just rips it out of the water in mm -hmm. order to maintain that ratio. And that is what's causing the higher pH. But this is an, a very unnatural process. So what I did do is, and a lot of Moonshine users that started doing the same, they did see the same effect after a while because your carbonate ratio needs to kind of rebalance. It mm -hmm. takes a while. It really takes a while. So you need to be patient. And you're going to... Uh, Apparently, Brightwell, it's a little bit more expensive. You, you could basically do the same at, at home while you're mixing soda ash with baking soda. Mm -hmm. uh, I just use their, their product, and it, it's great. It's a little bit more costly than other products, but it, it really works really well. And you, you, you use that, and you rebalance your carbonate and, uh, ratio in your tank, and it brings, after a while, you will see that the pH goes uh, mm -hmm. up up again uh, yeah. significantly and that is a uh, that is something that has that have a lot of people experienced uh, unless the ones that do have a true acid issue mm -hmm. if you have two acid issues with certain foul acids owning acids in your tank that's a different ball game then you need to start looking into um, you, you know not just aeration you need to look into uh, your bacteria biology having enough substrate in there and utilize carbon in or you know activated carbon to get these acids out of the water for the most part but be careful uh, activated carbon will not take out all the acids in there mm. but it's a different it's a okay. different story <laughs> yeah that's right okay so yeah. in, in the handbook i mean before you fully dive into it it does kind of concentrate on keeping you know make sure your nutrients are in check make sure your dosing stable you know make sure you yeah. have a solid ph so basically get all the the general foundation stuff yeah. first the moonshiner method the moonshiner method is when when a lot of people ask me hey how do you maintain your your biology your your, your, your nutrients and your your your, your, your alkalinity and calcium um, i leave that completely to everyone's preferred method what people are most you know feel most confident mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. um, it and it doesn't really matter if you do uh if you do like carbon, carbohydrates, deep sand beds, ketomorpha, uh, reactors, GFO, whatever. Um, do whatever you feel most confident with. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it doesn't really affect the Moonshiner method. Yeah. That, that, that is uh, one, one thing that uh, we would tell everyone. So don't, don't be afraid. Don't be too scared when start looking to the chemistry. The a successful reef, really, which you see in the Moonshiners group, you see a lot of people having, you know, a lot of success on, on very short time. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, to be honest, because there are more. There's more things to a successful reef, right, than just uh, the, the chemistry. Yeah. Um, I think this is mainly like three things as light, mm -hmm. right, which we shouldn't really have uh, issues with nowadays with all these fancy uh, light pictures out there. Yeah. Then there is the chemistry. If, uh, the chem if a chemistry doesn't is always not well maintained, you're going to have an issue because uh, uh, the coral need a lot of these elements and vitamins and nutri not, not nutrients, of course, to really um, perform their metabolic processes, and that's what's what's really you know uh, provide these these nice fancy colorations. Yeah. Uh, if anything is there missing, it's screwed. You know, it, if the process doesn't work anymore, mm -hmm. uh, then Another thing is the biology. The biology is also very important. And that is really where there's so much variation out there. How you could manage your tank, I really didn't want to touch it. And um, like I said, here again, I wanted to leave it to everyone's preferred uh, method. Um, I have not seen a tank where the, the filtration method or or the you know biology bio or nutrient management system really caused any complications or collision with a, with a, with a chemistry method or moonshine method really wow. mm -hmm. okay that's fair yeah. well okay uh, here's a random one um because i know certain like 
macroalgae will obviously absorb nutrients or nutrients and trace elements. Um, yeah. Like GFO probably absorbs a certain amount of trace elements. I always wonder how much that's like sucking up of it as you go. Oh, ah, oh, gosh. Um, there is one ICP lab, Oceamo, mm -hmm. in Austria. And I actually, I was the first Oceamo ICP customer out of the United States. Uh, this guy, uh, Chris, Dr. Christoph Denk, he runs Oceamo. Uh, Oceamo, well, I am really a king of mispronunciation here. So, po apologize for that, by the way. That's uh, ideal so time, too. <laughs> you go to the Oceamo's website. Mm -hmm. He did a test of, um, I think, GFO and a variety of carbon. He didn't mention brands, but he made a kind of comparison of uh, the impact of these different media on, on, on different trace elements and, 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 yeah, mostly trace elements because we are, we're kind of in competition, except he has a nice ICP machine, which I don't. Um, but he's in Austria, and, and he basically does the same. We, we share a lot of our experience and, and, and um, talk a lot with each other. So he has done a couple of uh, tests on activated carbons and GFOs. Mm -hmm. And the absorption rates between these different brands is very, very different. Do they absorb trace elements? Yes. And, but that's not rocket science. Um, yeah. GFO is basically, um, yeah, it's an exchange it's it's kind of working similar to an exchange regime. <laughs> it it takes something and gives something, right? Mm -hmm. um, majority is it, it takes trace elements with phosphates and and other good stuff. Yeah. And uh, the majority of what most uh, GFOs give us is is copper in very small amounts, but they mm -hmm. can be useful at that point in time. Um, what I have seen is when I use GFO, uh, maybe I used always I was too impatient. And I uh, used too much, too fast, and you know, too quick. That's trouble. I always had bleaching events. Um, I wasn't really happy with uh, using GFO on a long t on a long term. With if I do have too much PO4 in my tanks and it bothers me too much, mm -hmm. what I normally do is I take a bag of zeolite, put it in my sock uh, or my 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 you know in my in my tank somewhere where I have a lot of flow, and I let the zeolite basically help to absorb uh, phosphates. Mm. That's just temporary, not forever. And then I take it out again because zeolite also absorbs a lot of trace elements. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I didn't know that did phosphate as well. I thought that was just for nitrates. Good to know. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it absorbs phosphates and ammonia a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it does, the surface of the zeolite basically provides the, the substrate for certain bacteria. And okay. You grow on the surface, they absorb the nitrates and other uh, nutrients, and then you know, when you have this shaker, these vibrant reactors, or these vibe reactors, you basically wash off uh, uh, the bacteria and skim them out, and that is basically how the export works. Mm. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So I talked to Thomas Paul once, and he explained me his zeolite, and he said, well, after the absorption or the saturation is reached, mm. when the zeolite has basically taken out all the phosphate it can, it's basically uh, it's basically a biomedia from that point on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, okay, so now this is probably going to get asked. Um, so, on your tanks, mainly a fan of dosing now. Um, what what is your setup that you run on your main systems? Uh, concerning your know, overall. Yeah, just just overall. Okay. Like, what's so, your preferred well, I'm, uh... way to run a tank? <laughs> My preferred way to run a tank. Um, I do have a water box, which is filling up right now. It's almost full of RODI. Looks so I'm good. going to be ready for salt, <laughs> yep. uh, hopefully by this weekend. The reason why I bought this tank is I want to have a, a new demo, you know, a, a demo tank for the Moonshiner. I had this huge, humongous 300-gallon tank, beautiful tank. Mm -hmm. It only lasted two and a half years, and I had to break it down. Ah. Um, so and then I have this lagoon tank here in my, in my, in my study, in my, uh, in, my, in my shipping station here. Um, the way I run my tanks is typically I uh, use I use a lot of rock. I use a very large variety of substrate for the biology, actually, mm -hmm. to minimize the risk of cyano and fungi and and other you know undesired bacteria that you that you may have in your tank. Um, basically, uh, skimmer. I always run skimmer on my tanks. Mm -hmm. 
because of degassing. I want to get foul gases out. That's Ooh. so important. Yeah, foul gas is a good thing. You want to have these going out. Fresh oxygen going into the tank because there's a lot of things that need oxygen and it helps oxi oxidizing bad components. Uh, it triggers certain bacteria to grow and populate that take out the really bad stuff. Um, that's another thing. So I, I run skimmers all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that don't run skimmers. They run it successful. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe it's because there's tons of corals at the end of my tanks, and they are heavily loaded with with corals. Yeah. Uh, some people tell me, "Hey, you, you, I don't see any fish in your tanks," but they are also almost so full of corals. How do you do that? I said, "Well, um, to be honest, all these tanks were temporary. You know, at the time I started being more popular on social media, so." It is. I would love to have more fish, but it's just I, I start doing these tanks, and you know, and then a year, a two year, you know, and still no, no fish in there. So, um, but that proves actually that you don't really necessarily have to have a, a huge amount of fish load in your tank in order to have beautiful corals. That's not the case, and I think it helps a little bit to keep the bio load the bio load down. Uh, on, on, on nutrients uh, when you when you don't have too many fish. I talk a lot to Mike Paletta, which is uh, one of my, my one of my, my friends as well, and he uses reef moonshiners as well. Mm -hmm. See, he sometimes talks about it in some of his interviews as well and live yep. streams. And uh, he sometimes says, yeah, Andre, maybe I do have too many fish in my tanks. This is why I have sometimes nutrients issues. And um, <sighs> when with new water box tank is set up, it's gonna have more fish in there because this is going to be considered a, a permanent tank yes. and show tank and demo tank so that will have more fish in there mm -hmm. so from a filtration method i will have the biggest or the, the biggest challenge really in, in maintaining reef tanks in my opinion is and in my experience as well is maintaining free of phosphates mm -hmm. nitrates there are so many things you can do yeah. absorption uh, uh, biology, bacteria, skimming, there's, there's all sorts of stuff you can do, but PO4 is always, or phosphorus and, and phosphate is always very challenging. Yep. And um, I was, in, my, in, the, in, in my old days, I was always running deep sand beds, uh, which have their own little risks uh, when you do use them, but I never had issues with PO4. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I uh, started Reef Moonshiners officially uh, and as a brand, um, there were a couple of guys it were kind of fresh reef keepers, and they asked me what my opinion is. And I said, you know what, you should use a remote deep sand bed in your tanks. And, and all the guys who did, they had a huge amount of uh, coral load, huge amount of fish load, but surprisingly, they did not have any issues with PO4 usually, mm -hmm. except that something happened, right? That, yeah. that can always happen. Um, so when I started the Lagoon tank, um, which is a 150 gallon system. I said, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have whatever refugium section. I'm gonna have a deep sand bed in there as well, um, because it keeps it nice and clean all in the sump. And if mm -hmm. something goes wrong, I can disconnect the sump, can I move it out of the way, you know, refresh it or whatever, or get rid of it, mm -hmm. and then uh, can move on. So, and since I have a deep sand bed in there, it's terrible. Um, I had actually, I, I do basically things when I need it. Yeah. I had to come up with with my own. Can you see? I don't know if it's sharp. Yeah. Oh, it's almost almost. Go back a little bit. Oh, there you go. Phosphate yeah. in minus n. Uh, phos phosphorus. Phosphate. So I had I had to come up with my own phosphorus, a balanced phosphorus source, actually, and I'm I'm dosing tons of phosphorus. Mm -hmm. Actually, far too much, um, <laughs> as as I should, because I, even if I have it, I am not a friend of adding um, yeah fertilizers. Into, into the tank because even the purest uh, raw chemicals have some impurities, especially when it comes to phosphorus and, and fertilizing products. Um, so the, the water box tank is going to have as well a deep sand bed mm -hmm. in the sump. And uh, I predict from the data I collected from all these people that it will take between a less than a third, around a quarter, around a quarter of the surface of a tank surface is what yep. you need for a deep sand bed to sufficiently reduce your, your phosphates. 
Well, this is a theory. I will see how it works out. Let it. Let us know in six months. Yeah. So in like no, nah, uh, no, no, no. I'm I'm that... I'm 46 old. I don't have time. So we <laughs> need to be up and running within a month, and uh, you know, so I can break down the lagoon. Mm -hmm. So. One other thing that you mentioned earlier is these tanks also so, have lots of uh, corals. Deep sand is something I'm, what I prefer. Oh, there you go, chop it off. Yeah, you, you broke up. Can you repeat that? Oh, I was going to say, so one of the other things you mentioned is these tanks had lots of corals. And that's also going to suck up nutrients, too, if you have a ton of encrusting growing corals. Definitely helps. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, in addition to uh, the deep sand bed, um, I do run uh, some mechanical filtration, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be typically it's going to be either like a, a mesh sock, uh, just a screen, a mesh. Uh, and if the tank is really dirty, I run sometimes uh, felt socks. Mm -hmm. uh, but majority of if I have a space, I'm going to use the so-called power filter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if, you, if you're interested in what a power filter is, uh, look it up. I'm going to have a video coming out on how to build one. Uh, what it really does, it, it destroys microorganisms in, in your tank. It's free floating. It's, it sort of looks like a power head. Mm -hmm. But what it really does, it, it, it causes a low pressure environment, almost like, like a vacuum condition inside the suction uh, section of the, of the, of the pump the filter mm -hmm. and it destroys uh, uh, microorganisms mm -hmm. and um, it's, it's a really fancy nice easy do-it-yourself tool and it's very effective people that do that they do see a lot of clarity in a short period of time mm -hmm. uh, on their tank so only thing is what you have like this ugly thing you know sort of in hanging in your tank but if you have a beautiful reef tank you will barely see it um, on Sorry. the lagoon tank it, it kind of is in the way it doesn't matter where I put it so that, mm -hmm. that's to be honest, uh, on the uh, waterworks tanks, uh, I, I will probably have it somewhere in the corners. Yep. So that take care of mechanical filtration to keep the particles out of the tank and the water, you know, somewhat clean. Because I'm a strong believer in uh, in a, in a, in, a, in a low population of bacteria in your water column. You want to have the bacteria in your substrate. That's where they belong to. You know, where they're taking care mm -hmm. of your of your biology, of your nutrients, and everything. But the stuff typically in the water column, mm -hmm. like as on beautiful natural reefs, is typically lower in bacteria. So that means yes. it, it can be particles, right? If you see free floating particles, food, phytoplankton, and all the good mm -hmm. stuff, planktonic food, you can have have all that floating around. But you what you don't want to have is actually too many bacteria in the in the water. That's what you don't want. And when you run your tank and all you do is between like a slight cloudy tank and you put the power filter in and after like two, three days, uh, you're going to have much more clarity, better light penetration, of course. You mm -hmm. see uh, the color of the corals becomes more vibrant, more yeah. reflective in the light, more more fluorescence, right? Um, it, it makes a big difference. I think I feel the, the corals look much healthier and happier when, they, when you have... Uh, Good, clear, clear water. Yeah. Okay, question. Why not put the power filter in the sump by the sock area or somewhere? Well, um, you can try it. It really depends on how much turnaround rate mm. you have on your tump, on your sump to your tank. Um, I personally tried it. If you have, if I have my, my, my return pump running enough water flow, um, it, it, it can work. It's, it's really a configuration and okay. uh, play around with things too. Some people don't really have it turn around through their sum mm -hmm. in order to achieve really the uh, yeah the, okay. the That's fair. performance of the uh, full effectiveness of the power filter. Okay. I, the power I, filter actually is uh, something that the, uh, the traditional DSR method, the Dutch synthetic reefing method, mm -hmm. also uses. Um, I found this power filter in a very old literature on of Albert Thiel and some other guys. Uh, in the in the 70s 80s, and I saw it also on uh, the DSR reefing websites, and I tried it out, and it works. It works really well. Mm -hmm. So, nice. Platform, good okay. thing. Right. Really awesome. Another question. So, I have one let's more talk question. about the rest of. Let's talk about the rest okay, of okay, the okay. setup. How I run my tanks. Okay. Um, I what I also have is I have um, some sort of biofilter mm. for ammonia and aerobic filtration. Um, it 
right now, due to space constraints, I run the Bash C or the Bash C biofilter. Uh, that is what I'm running on my Lagoon. Works really well. Uh, I'm going to use it on the uh, water box tank as, as you know. Also, in the past, on my my marine land tank, marine land tank, I had basically both overflows filled with old bio balls. You know these these black yep. little balls, the trickle filters. They were filled up to the top, and the water trickled through this. The problem with that is they do clog and get dirty, and then getting it all out, that is uh, quite a mess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Actually, that's it. I, I pay attention to a lot of um, substrate, variety of substrate, uh, like biomedia, uh, plastic medias, sand or gravel, um, Seaporax pond, something, you know, they have a variety of different substrate in your tank to allow uh, as much bacteria strains to grow in your tank. Yeah, makes sense. So why so why don't you like bacteria in the water column? I'm curious because what one side of me is like, that's kind of coral fluid in a way because it can eat it. And then the other part of me is like, well, if you run UV or ozone and stuff, you're going to basically kill off most of that anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, I per, yeah. You, you always have bacteria in the water column anyways, right? Mm-hmm. So, and yes, corals feed on bacteria. and They, they eat bacteria as well. Um, the problem is you have more bad bacteria free-floating in your water column than Fair. the good bacteria. No. That, that's really the enough. reason. So it's kind of... Huh, it's beneficial, benefit versus risk, yep. and uh, I personally like rather keep a, it's it's counterproductive. You put a power filter in, you keep the water clean, mm-hmm. and then you start feeding zooplankton and phyton and all this good stuff. Costs a lot of money, and you put it all in, and then you have a power filter just sucking, sucking it all, it up. Up, right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a little bit counterproductive. But uh, I think every, everybody has to has to find the right balance between enough food in the tank and um, yeah mm-hmm. enough crisp in the water the crisp in the water is really what what makes a difference if you look from the side through the tank and it looks all milky cloudy it's potentially more bacteria more yep. undesired bacteria if it's just particles floating around that's okay as long mm-hmm. you can you can see still a little bit of a crisp hint in your in your water yep. now do you use uv ozone on your systems um, I do not currently use UV. Mm-hmm. I, sometimes I use ozone uh, just to get rid of the uh, the yellow yellow compounds. Yeah. The problem with ozone is um, it increases the you know oxidation level of your tank, and um, well, it also causes nitric acid, hmm. and that is something. Ozone is really if if you do too much and you cannot really measure it if. You, do use too much you're going to have a negative impact on your tank and when things don't look really that that nice and healthy and happy you think in all sort of directions is it my my water chemistry is it maybe a a disease is it a bacteria issue is something else going on you really it's it's so so difficult so ozone is something what i would recommend only really to experience reefers uh, Mm -hmm. to deal i would definitely set it up appropriately with uh, like a recirculating system uh, where the ozone and the water is separate from the system, the water is sterilized with the ozone and then going through activated carbon, mm-hmm. right, and then goes back to the tank. And then the question remains is, since you have to use ozone and activated carbon together, what does clear the water? Is it really the carbon or is it the ozone? So <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I... I don't have the UV on right now, but um, I do. I do run a small amount of ozone every night just because it gives you that crystal clear water, which I love with the peninsula tank. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, something that we talked about a while back, which I thought was interesting, because you mentioned today about using a skimmer in order to help off gas and get rid of the nasty stuff, and yeah. again, yes. bring in fresh yeah. air. So you weren't a fan of the recirculating. Uh, CO2 scrubber because of, of oh, yeah. all the nasty gas that goes back in, yeah, yeah. which I know a lot of people do. So that might be like an interesting yeah. one to touch on. And to be honest, it's if you you know there's a lot of designs out there that do promote that, mm-hmm. and there is always a big conflict I do see between chemists and biochemists. Mm-hmm. They they fight with each other. They they never they, they, you know. On a chemist, a chemist thinking is really like you know he thinks in formulas. He you know a sort of certain of, of chain reaction is going to happen, and he predicts what's going to happen. And he's typically these guys are geniuses, right? Uh, the biochemist 
he takes into consideration also the 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 biological aspects of reactions that are going to happen. And if you find two, you know, one of each side, and you combine it, that would be pretty awesome. And these are the guys that, that you know, that really have it going on. So uh, that, that is, the, you know, the best, the best situation. Yep. Ah, uh, lots of fun, eh? All right, so not putting the nasty gas in. But what was the question? Actually, you know, I think, I, think I, I lost you on, on, on the main question. A little, little, little bit, okay. So... Because for like recirculating CO2 scrubbers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, degassing of foul foul gases are the, the biggest concern, and and fresh oxygen. So there are a lot of skimmers out there, design wise. They do use the recirculation of their of their of gas actually, re you know reinsert it into the skimmer uh, diffuser, and what it does actually, it it kind of brings your pH up. Mm -hmm. no, no matter what, it somewhat brings your pH up, but it doesn't really help to get foul gases, methane, you know, all the methanes and all the other nitric acid to produce gases, getting those out of the tank. Yeah. And it also, um, it, it doesn't help to get fresh oxygen into the tank. So mm -hmm. what, I, what I tend to do is I, I run my, my skimmer line uh, out, out, of his, out of his tent. Yeah. The intake from the skimmer um, ideally goes to the outside. Here in Houston, that's a really big issue because we have like this you know, mosquito killer truck going mm -hmm. around every night. So that is not good. Um, but I, at least I try to get the, uh, the air inlet hose getting outside of a stand, taking room air. Mm -hmm. So that brings sometimes a lot of CO2 in there, but at least a certain amount of oxygen because the, all the degassed and foul gases are basically sitting down there in the, in the stand. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. It's sucking so. it, recirculating it. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, even like uh, some of the you know the big marine biologists uh, on reef or even other they kind of are also promoting to do not recirculate your air, getting fresh oxygen in, which is really what we what we what the organisms need. Yep. So I did a bit of a hybrid one on mine where I have I have a little container with some soda lime on top. Yep. But yep. that would so it does circulate, but I also put a tea in it, so it's also sucking fresh air. So it's kind of yeah. a blend. In case you're kind of mixing it, right? Yeah. You bring some oxygen in there. You also bring some of the recirculated air back in through the through the solar lime. And um, well, if you keep recirculating it, uh, you don't drag in so much of the fresh CO2 from the room. Mm -hmm. And whatever comes out of the skimmer, I did some experiments on on my previous skimmers. And um, typically, my skimmers exhausted like air in the range of 200 to 300 ppm of CO2, yeah. while the room had at least 600, 700 ppm of CO2. Yeah. So taking the skimmer air is definitely you know better than, than taking the air from there. Yeah. But I always ask my question: Why is there no more CO2 uh, in the exhaust of the skimmer if it degasses the CO2? Mm -hmm. Well, that answer I got when I went through the carbon cycle, because there is very little um, aqu yeah, aqueous CO2 actually. Um, yeah, it's kind of, under it's, it's like true pure CO2 in the water that can gas out. Yeah. There's not much in there. Uh, there's a very quick reaction going to happen where the CO2 in the water gets, into, uh, gets converted into carbonic acid. Mm -hmm. It's part of its equilibrium. And uh, so getting that out, only activated carbon would remove acids, right? So degassing really only takes out a small amount of the of CO2. Yeah. That is actually what, what, what I found out at the end. Good to know. Yeah. Carbon, activated so carbon is sort of acids. I did not know that. In order to get your pH up, you really need to re uh, reduce the amount of CO2 going into the intake. Yeah. And then, yeah, I have to agree. When you take your exhaust from your skimmer and your cup, mm -hmm. put it back in, that has definitely less CO2, so your pH benefits from it. And you don't need uh, as much soda lime mm -hmm. uh, on, on, your, on your little bag or reactor or whatever you use. Yeah. Um, yeah. It definitely a thing. Uh, actually, the uh, Reef Moonshine Handbook, it has a trouble shooting section, mm -hmm. which nobody really reads unless they are in trouble. I read it. Uh, and it talks <laughs> about, it has two subjects actually covered. One is um, the, uh, 
water changes why why you know what my point is on on why not why not water changes or why water changes are not really required and the other subject is really low ph things it has a variety of different things in there uh what you can do in order to tackle a low ph mm -hmm. that's some, maybe something helpful for for some of the viewers today i've probably implemented most of them so <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Air exchanger outside air. Well, I tell you what, uh, you, you try it. Go and buy yourself alkaline 8.3p mm. and set it up on a dozer and start dozing that. Okay. Do, do it hybrid awesome. or whatever, but supplement a balanced ratio of carbonate and bicarbonates with that product. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's talk in a couple of months if if your pH uh, went back up. Because what I what I would predict in your case, because I know you 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 dealt a lot with this with this pH issue. Yeah. Uh, same here. I, I did, did did the same thing, and I was extremely surprised about what a rebalanced carbonate ratio can do to your to your pH and to your tank. Try that. And I will. It can only get better, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, right now, I've done the air exchanger. I got outside air. I have some soda lime recirculating mixing with the fresh air into the yeah, skiver. Yeah. And now, recently, I added just a very small amount of calc washer, but just a very yeah. slow drip through a little reactor just to yeah. get that little boost. It's, it's in a happy place now, but... Imagine I did do all that. I did all this good stuff, all these, yeah. you know, big reactors. And, you know, having having a company like, like Reef Moonshine in the back helps me to buy even the fancy stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So I you oh, this huge reactor and all kind of stuff. So I did all that, and I was barely able to maintain my, my pH uh, high enough, right? So that it doesn't cause any issues. And now, same tanks, same setup, nothing different. Uh, and I have to... Do something to get my pH down now Just put because your calcium reactor back on. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah I, I think I mean this tank will not run very long anymore because as soon the water box is up and running and I'm, mm -hmm. I can transfer everything, then I'm probably gonna be good. But I I I, I, I feel that I'm gonna have to do something like this. And uh, in the past, uh, CO2 reactors were pretty common mm -hmm. to fertilize your tank, freshwater tanks and yep. saltwater tanks with CO2. So. Yep. So no. could, could be a good option. I mean, would, I know you're not a fan of the media right now, so you're not using calcium reactor, but would you consider maybe doing a calcium reactor to add like half of your dosing, then dose the other half, or do you like to stick to one system only? Well, with that tank, the Lagoon tank, I started doing the dosing. Um, I had, when I started the tank, I did the, the, new, the new reefers uh, method, and I started completely with a sanitized dry rock tank. Mm -hmm. And I I ran into all sorts of issues, and at one point I had osteoporosis so badly that I started losing corals, and I, I started whining when I got into my fish room, right, because of the, of the, of the, of the toxins. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, well, I'm done with all these methods that are out there. You know, I'm going to go old school. So I did that, adjusted some things. Two days later, all the osteoporosis were gone. You know, mm -hmm. everything perfectly fine. Corals started yep. recovering. You know, everything was great. So then. Also, my dosing system, which I have set up at that point in time, mm -hmm. started to consume more stuff. Um, well, I'm running through 400 milliliters of alkalinity solution, 300 milliliters per day of calcium solution. So it's it's, it's kind of it starts to accumulate, and I'm going to get into the into a high amounts of dosing solutions uh, mm -hmm. pretty pretty quickly. So what I'm thinking about going forward. Doing the hybrid, where yep. I may gonna run a smaller calcium reactor, not too mm -hmm. big, um, along with with dosing, and and kind of you know mix both. As soon as yep. I find a good a good media. Yep, yeah, that's the challenge. I know yeah. it sucks the, the good stuff. That's, yeah, mine's about half the good stuff, and the other half is the random stuff. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if somebody wants to dive into the Moonshiners, um, first step, I mean, obviously, go read the handbook. Yeah, there's, uh, if you just follow the steps on the website, how the system works, uh, it kind of walks you very nicely, described, easy, easy language, because, uh, you know, everything is written for non-scientific people. Uh, just look through the quick guide and you're going to get kind of an impression of what's what's needed and if you're still interested and it's not too overwhelming download the handbook read it and you're basically pretty much ready to go and um yeah 
it's 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 really easy it looks really overwhelming in the beginning especially for people who are not familiar with chemistry mm-hmm. and uh, but at the end you if you're going to join the moonshiner group on facebook there's so many people thousands of people actually now using it and they're all saying the same they will say oh man it's, it looks a lot just start doing it follow the directions just do what andre says in this tool you know you're going to be good and you're going to need a bigger tank in a, in a year from now <clears throat> yeah that I- is it's actually not a lie. It's going to happen. It's, it's happening to a lot of people. It happens. Yeah, the corals are happy. They grow better. I mean, corals are grow too fast, too, too, you know, too extreme, and it's, uh, people need bigger tanks then. Yep, exactly. That's it, it, great. It's great. One big thing I notice is it makes you pay a lot more attention to your tank. The, like the little things where you might gloss you know what? over. What, what I noticed when I one – of the, one of the reasons was like lazy reefer syndrome, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to – with, with so big reef tanks, uh, 200 gallon and bigger, with all these corals, you know, a lot of money in there, it makes your reefing life much relaxed because you do, yes, you, you spend 50 bucks per month on this test, right? Mm-hmm. And you're going to wait for this test and you're going to get the results. You put it in your tool, you make your corrections. But on a once a month, you know what's going on. You can see things happening in advance. If, for example, like, I don't know if you followed, uh, like, uh, Mark Levinson, yep. where he ran out of potassium. Ooh, potassium, really. That couldn't happen to a reef moonshiners because on a monthly basis, he would basically see how potassium is going to drop mm-hmm. and he would correct it. Uh, and it, same applies to other elements that, that may go into so low that it really cause harm to a tank. So you, and also when things do not really look right, mm-hmm. um, you don't ask yourself a question. Oh man, is it iodine too low, too high? Is my potassium too low, too high? There's so many things you can't really measure with test kits. Um, it, it takes care of that stuff. And there yeah. are some some elements that are really, really crucial, and have been. I observed this a lot of times with these thousands of people actually that are using that system now and and giving me feedback and i talk a lot to these people mm-hmm. and there are always certain elements as soon as they run out or very low they have tn issues they are they are like like barium and bromine if they are very low mm-hmm. in like 90 percent of these cases even if there's no scientific evidence that barium for example has a a, a microbiological role in the cause if you run so low into like the two, three microgram ranges, these people do a lot of times have TN, RTN, STN issues on their tanks. Mm-hmm. The same with bromine. Bromine below 30, 40 is, is a lot of times linked to, to tissue necrosis issues. And as soon as these people take for corrections, yes, things do not happen overnight. The tank doesn't recover overnight. But at least within a few weeks, they're going to see with a, with a few other corrections that they can do, uh, they're going to see, you know, big improvements. And um, I, I, do, I do see this a lot. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Nice. That's awesome. Uh, hey, if things are stable, they're going to be happy. But it, it yeah, makes yeah. sense. Like, I'm not as hardcore to do it every month. I do an ICP every few months. But yeah. it's still those trends, you know. And you're like, oh, yeah. tweak a little more, tweak a little less, yeah. pop in your numbers. Yeah. and. It's 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 you 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 you're gonna be much more relaxed. You know that you have a, an eye on your on your on your water parameters. Uh, you don't have to do water changes anymore. You can you know feel free to do as much water changes as you want. But the more water changes you do, the more corrections you're gonna do. You know, my wallet mm-hmm. will say thank you. Um, <laughs> but I, I, do whatever you prefer. Water changes is still the best way to get out of the water, which we don't want to have in there. So mm-hmm. from that perspective, water changes are, are a good thing. But if you don't do water changes, you have a lot more stability. And whatever impurities are in that salt will not get into your tank. And I can promise you, my my raw chemists, my, my raw chemicals are, are yes, but what because I'm using it for me, yep. it's, it's my it's my baby. I want to, I want to use the most um, reef compatible uh, chemists, you know, chemicals, raw chemicals that, that, are, that are out there. They're mm-hmm. not cheap, um, and you know, this is this is this is really uh, what what I recommend. And and if you do run your tank with certain medication treatments, then yeah, sure, you, you have to do your your uh, your water changes to get this stuff out again. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, that's yeah. It's still it's still good once in a while, just because I mean, it depends what you're dosing, but and you a don't lot of how to do it. Hmm? And you don't forget how to do it. <laughs> don't forget how to do it. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it depends. Why well, you can flood your dining room, your you know your living room, you know, getting I've all the water out again. That's why the I water. automated mine, just so <laughs> I would prevent me from spilling. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, cause... yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's 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 a much relaxed reefing, mm -hmm. and you keep an eye on your chemistry, and also with the ATI test, you also have an eye on your your the health of your of your RODI cartridges. A lot of times people are very surprised to see that we are, the eye cartridges are causing issues. Um, I personally prefer the Spectra Pure uh, high capacity silicate buster cartridges. You find them also on my, on my web store, but also on Amazon. So buy them wherever they are, where, you know, where you find them cheapest. Um, but these ones are really, from my experience, fixed almost every ROTI system issue, which I have encountered, um, huh. especially when it comes to silicate issues, but also to, to, to other issues. Um, a lot of times I feel that people are, do not handle refillable resins in their, in their ROTI systems or, or just, just, just a bad media. Now, what? And also, what people I do, people see they 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 putting booster pumps on their uh, ODI systems, yeah. which I'm not really a friend of. I, I mean, I ran the biggest tank, 300, 400 gallon tanks, which with a 550 gallon per day uh, ODI system. Yeah, re first fill that takes a quite a while. But mm -hmm. uh, why do you need like a 300 gallon per day uh, ODI system? Uh, what happens is with these cartridges, it's still the same cartridge on a small unit than on a big unit. Mm -hmm. You're going to have much more flow, faster flow going through it, and the resin has less contact time, right? And if you run your water through <laughs> this resin too fast, it might pass the capacity or, you know, the absorption rate what the resin could give you. And um, then stuff is just passing by. And then you have at the end, you have to, you know, you have a fast ODI. Yeah, but where's the point if you have like still, you know, residues left in your, in your, in your DI water? Interesting. So be careful with your boosters. That's not something I ever really would have considered. But yeah, that is something, that's something what I learned from water treatment system engineers, uh, where we paid a lot of attention. And I, they were surprised when I started asking so many questions on that particular DI systems so, because you know, that was a chance to really talk to industry experts on, on, on our ODI systems. And this is where I learned that. They, they paid a lot of attention to it. So to your point, because I from September, I have my two ATI CP tests, and I just checked my RODI, and I have silicone... 1319 UG, so micro micrograms, I yeah. think it is. Yes, microgram, yeah. And that, that one has the booster pump. And my one without the booster pump has nothing registered for silicone. <laughs> well, huh. you may want to take a booster pump off and see. Yeah, just do it. Just take a booster pump off and, yep. and see if you can, uh, if you can measure the difference. And I bet you have measured zero TDS on that, on that water still. Yeah. Even if. You... Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it's because your TDS meters, they only recognize at one TDS is basically, yeah, one ppm, yeah. 1,000 microgram. So if it starts detecting at 500 microgram, mm -hmm. everything below is, in theory, zero. not really showing right zero. Right. Interesting. Huh, that was yeah. actually really interesting to just look it up and see it right now. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, do it, do it, do it. Uh, try it. Run, run without a booster pump and see if it works. I don't, what what particular uh, resin do you run in that in that DI system? Um, it is just the mix bed and it has dual chambers on the one. Dual it DI is on that one. Just a mix bed, so maybe a lower lower grade brand. So you may need to run lower uh, lower speeds of above lower velocities of water going through these resins because. Lower grade resins. It's not that they are lower grade; they're cheaper because they are they are they need more reaction time, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, it's really complicated. We don't really want to go there, but it, lower grade means also they they don't have the efficiency and capacity to take up these these ions from the water, so they need more time, more, more reaction time. Yeah. And if you boost the pump on this with a, yeah, you you huh. will have. That's interesting. That's, yeah, but it's, it's, you're gonna see that a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so Spectra Pure, pure uh, Silica Buster cartridge is high capacity, means it has a high absorption rate for longer time. It takes more stuff, 
mm-hmm. and to from what I have seen is it really takes up everything in almost every RODI system I, 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 I have seen I have had two free cases where people ran booster pumps like two booster pumps to have a 500 gallon per day rate yep. and a little nano tank of course and, and basically they just they just they just overdid it and I told them hey turn off the booster pumps do it again and yep. then turn off Huh. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this before next, like a month before I do the next ICP test. I'll just like let it run slower and see yeah. see the differences. So, so yeah, uh, back to a question. Well, it it gives you much more confidence on what's going on on your water on the chemistry side. Mm-hmm. Um, the the ATI tests recently, I you know I always get the same question. Ah, oh, it doesn't really match my 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 Trident uh, range you know, or my 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 uh, nitrate test kits and my phosphate test kits. So. Um, well, it's it's an it's an ICP's ATI. They they also have tolerances. Mm-hmm. Uh, we never know what the transportation of these samples are. Um, I personally do recommend on the ICP test focus on your on your chemistry and on your elements. Use their nitrate and phosphate reading as sort of and kind of an indication. But as soon as you send the sample out, your phosphate can change from today to tomorrow quite significantly. Mm-hmm. If you do something to your tank or and your water temperature goes up and you have a specific keto algae for example that can't handle that, that temperature it all gonna die and it releases all the phosphorus back to the tank and you're gonna have a um, phosphorus spike and a phosphate spike at the end yeah. so I would do testing of nutrients and and stuff like this I would do this at home and would not give too much attention to what ATI says yeah, well, that's fair. I mean, and if you are trying to compare, test your stuff the same day to your water sample. Because when you're looking at it two or three weeks later, it's obviously going to be way different. Yeah. yeah. I, I, act, I did do that with actually some of my parameters. It was pretty dang close, so it was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, if I have, uh, when, when I, I, I also once in a while, I do run numerous test brands. Mm-hmm. Um, because ATI is my main my main test. I I require that for for for, for the method actually. Then you also see Triton. Triton mm-hmm. is actually what I also sell on my web store, and I have like 30 tests, you know, uh, still here. Um, this is, I, Triton is really like a, as a backup um, in case something looks wrong and you want to have some confidence and you need test results quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, that happens a lot with like tanks that have issues with barium uh, depletion. They um, they need to have quick results and measure more in order to get to a saturation level. Um, then the Triton test is a perfect thing because you just give it to me. You know, it's quick and easy. Five days, six days, and you're going to have your test results. Um, it's it's of course tolerances with each test lab. You're going to have slight tolerances. Um, Triton is kind of the backup solution for 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 troubleshooting a tank when you don't really need to pay attention to the fluoride level because mm-hmm. fluoride unfortunately is what Triton doesn't measure that is what what comes out of the the, the ATI test so, so okay so with fluoride every time I do an ICP test I have to dose quite a bit of fluoride to get it back yeah. up to levels really okay yep. all right That's so here's and maybe we're going to do another session where we talk about the individual elements and what the experience uh, I made and also I got from so many people. The, the great thing on this huge community right now is that I do get a lot of uh, feedback and a lot of a lot of issues brought to my attention and a lot of observation. And after a while, even not looking at it from a scientific um, method, kind of, you know, re-evaluating everything 14 times over the next 10 years before you're going to publish it anywhere, you're going to look what you see and you see patterns. Yeah. And uh, with that community and the Moonshiners uh, group, uh, it, it's, it's amazing. And you're going to you're going to you're going to see certain things. Fluoride, for example, is mm-hmm. one of the elements where when you when you start a tank with dry rock, especially with dry rock tanks, I do see this quite a lot there. You're gonna have to dose fluoride for like half a year, quite a lot. Hmm. Then you kind of sort of reach an, a saturation level. Yeah. And suddenly, and this is why fluoride is so dangerous. Suddenly, you're gonna see um, kind of not that high of demand as it was all the time before. Mm-hmm. 
So that is basically why I do not recommend to blind flight on fluoride and you know, take whatever you dose for the last three months, skip one, two tests, and just dose on what the average was months before. Uh, I do not recommend to do that with fluoride because fluoride can be harmful when it reaches certain levels. Okay. So um, with that, you need to be careful. And what, this, what you see is an effect, uh, what I have seen quite a lot, on many tanks that have never been uh, done, you know, and supplemented with, with fluorides in the, in the past and uh, it needs quite reaching a saturation, saturation level before it kind of normalizes a little bit. However, yep. fluoride is my best seller. Um, <laughs> To be quite honest, yep. fluoride is used a lot, and that is the number one uh, element that you always need to have on mm -hmm. hand. And uh, it's a box filler. Uh, certain people buy like three, four, five bottles all at the same time, make the yep. most out of the sh shipping costs, and just have it sitting on the shelf. So we have it at home. Um, boron is actually number number two. Uh, you see uh, boron uh, consumption, yep. especially when tanks start thriving and taking off a lot. Mm -hmm. um, since boron has also been built into the corals a lot and it's been used up by uh, bacteria apparently as well, mm -hmm. boron consumption goes up as well. So boron is basically the number two. Um, and then barium, for yeah. example, is an element similar to 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 the uh, to fluoride. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have set to a saturation level, your barium is pretty stable. Um, tanks that but we have started with dry rock from certain regions, a specific dry rock. I don't want to call any brands here, but certain brands are prone for high barium demands in the first few months. And then it suddenly seems like it's being built into the skeleton of um, corals and also somehow into the yeah, calcifying organisms in the tank. And then you're kind of reaching a normalized level and you do very small corrections from month to month. Yeah. Well, my tank's fairly textbook, because I'm going to say fluoride was the one I needed the most of. Then there's probably bromine, and then probably barium and boron to, like, get everything yeah, back yeah. to happy levels. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much everyone you, you will notice. What you will notice is the daily elements, for example, they, they're used up so little mm -hmm. uh, on a daily basis. They last forever. Yeah. Right? Um, it's probably... The bottle is never going to be, it's like Worcester sauce, right? Have you ever seen someone who opens a second <laughs> bottle of Worcester sauce in his life? No. Last it's the same with, uh, with iron, cobalt, chromium. Manganese, manganese you're going to have to potentially uh, uh, oh. buy another bottle of. Uh, Rubidium's <laughs> almost empty. That one's low. <laughs> the rest are pretty, pretty good for the okay. dealers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of people asking about the mud and what's in the mud or what's kind of the... <laughs> The mud. the mud is genius. Uh, yeah, well, the uh, the liquid mud looks like this. Yep. Small little bottle. Uh, the liquid mud is basically the intention is there is, I think, 80, 90 different trace elements in there mm -hmm. that are literally impossible to dose uh, because it's... You don't like 80, 70, 70, 80 different uh, trace elements all at the same time. Um, and they are, they are rare, rare earth metals, exotic, and very, very, very small amounts. And the benefit of a traditional mud bed, for example, is that it releases slowly uh, amino acids, but uh, combined amino acids, but also majority of, of um, trace elements rare trace elements which we don't really have in in any other way coming into the tank other than our food sources you know uh, even soils are lacking on, on many of these of these of these ingredients so the um, the mud bed is the, the way to go mm -hmm. well not for me because mud is it's kind of it's 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 messy right mm -hmm. you have to replace it once in a while it's the most of the muds out there are kind of a turf more than a real mud bed the uh the real sea mud the fiji mud is is really the way to go actually to provide uh, some sort of, of of trace elements from from nature yeah. and also um what what you're going to find in there and you're going to can prove it even with a microscope there's a lot of microorganisms in the mud that are dormant. Mm -hmm. And soon you put them in the tank, like a few days and weeks later, you're going to have a lot of 
microorganism, bacteria, and other stuff coming out of it, which is nice, yep. um, which is what the liquid mud does not do. Mm -hmm. It does not provide you any of these microorganisms. This is just focusing on the trace elements that a mud bed would really uh, provide to your, to your reef. Um, so the mud bed is just too messy for me to deal with. Um, so I had to come up with something else because I really like the, the effects on the, on the trace element, on the chemistry side of a mud bed. So mm -hmm. uh, then I came up with that stuff. And that is an optional item. I do not recommend to buy it really in the beginning unless you have already a beautiful tank. You have to do like at least one month of first correction, let things stable or stabilize. You know, have a tank looking good first a little bit. Um, and then you can enhance further and put in like the liquid mm -hmm. mud and also the, uh, the vitamins and vitamins in there. Yep. That's kind of, I list them in the, in, the, in the shopping list at the very bottom as optional items, which I recommend strongly to use them, but not at the beginning. Well, once kind of once when, your tank's you know, been settled for a while, stuff stable. Done correction or two. Um, some people just come in there, they, say they buy the whole line and just, just go with it and do it from the first day. And you can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you have to watch your wallet and this expensive, this hobby is already expensive, uh, put them on the list for next purchase, you know, and uh, it's yep. a good box filler. Yep, excellent. Um, yeah. Now, is there any other big things you'd recommend to somebody new looking to try this? Well, read the handbook once or twice, right? <laughs> or three times, yep. <laughs> um, definitely would recommend I always get the question: Do I have to have experience, you know, on the on the system to be to to be able to do it? And um, that was one of the the biggest concerns I had in the beginning because the success rate on this method is really really high. Mm -hmm. But also it is high because the people that are started doing it, they're kind of experienced reefers. They know what they're doing in terms of nutrient management, you know, dosing, calcium reactors, equipment. So they were not really green, you know, with when, when they came on, on the hobby, on, on this method. And that was, I like that because it made sure that really everyone succeeded with, or almost everyone succeeded when, when, on, when on the method. Um, but then I started getting more and more people interested uh, on on this method when they had barely any 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 experience on on reef game, right? They mm -hmm. just bought the tank, you know, all this fancy equipment, and uh, yeah, had no idea. So I I just did some some people took some people on and, and ran the uh, the system with them, and um, it helped actually the experience with these guys actually helped to develop and fine tune some of the handbook tools. Uh, you will see that there is a classic calculator that you can download to do your own things, but that was so complicated I had to simplify it further. So that's mm -hmm. why I came up with this assessment tool where you just hammer in your data and it does everything for you. Um, so. Actually, the results from these newbies on the in the hobby doing this method was actually phenomenal. They mm -hmm. didn't know and I didn't understand what they were doing, kind of. They just followed the rules and guidelines, but they 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 were very very successful right from the beginning. So, if you are doing your first reef tank and you're just starting with some some salt and some water and some fish and some rock and I would say stay away from that. That mm -hmm. is far too overwhelming. I would say give it like half a year, getting familiar a little bit with the nutrient measurements and, and how to manage phosphates. You know, as bad it sounds, you know, kill your first coral, kill your first fish, right? Getting adjusted to uh, pH and, and some of the basics of water chemistry. And if you still like that hobby and you understand more of it, look into it and mm -hmm. maybe it's it's going to help you to, to succeed on uh, on the next steps yeah. i do have um, a lot of coral farms actually on this method and you will be surprised how many of how many coral farms out there basically are on my on my client list nice a um, couple of local fish stores um, do also uh, buy the stuff on wholesale 
which is pretty interesting and pretty exciting. So stuff goes out in, in mm -hmm. numerous ways, and uh, some, some a lot of people just texting me, which I never heard of, because they buy it in the store and say, Andre, oh man, I'm so excited. My cars are fluffing up, you know, my sewers are exploding. Your method is great. It works all. It's so it's so nice and easy. And uh, I say, yeah, great, yeah, awesome. And I don't even know who we are. And then, you know, but 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 kind of kind of. Uh, trying to stay in touch as much as possible with, you, with these guys mm -hmm. um, and uh, still get sometimes questions from some people where they have issues to understand uh, anything on, on, on this method and I have a little long list and which, which I'm working off uh, with with improvements to help people to uh, yeah succeed and, and you know adapt to this to this method and have, mm -hmm. have an easy, easier easier life mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so there's a few, there's a handful of people in the chat questioning their motivation to actually dose things daily. Um, so there is, I know you did have a doser-friendly version. I haven't tried it, but I believe you had one yeah. that was okay. doser-friendly. <laughs> so, yeah, this, what I have done, and actually what I did is, I, I did it actually for nanotanks. Mm -hmm. There is, um, each of the four dailies exists in a normal version, which is highly concentrated. And, you know, the bottle will last longer than you normally, uh, unless you are 20. Um, the same dailies are available in nano versions. And the na I call it nano pump version because that would actually allow to be used on nano tanks, which is like hundred gallons, okay, 80, 40, you know, 25 gallons, whatever. And the, the, the basic dosing is you need one milliliter per day mm -hmm. on 100 Make it really easy. It means, you know, 50 gallons, 0.5 milliliters per day. Yep. Really easy. Um, and that concentration is actually good enough to be able to dose with most of the dosing systems that are out there. I mean, if you have a DOS system, I think you can go to increments of 0.05 or 0.02 yep. milliliters. Really, really small, which I don't even trust that it really can do it. However... Um, if you want to dose these four elements, you can do it on dosing pumps, definitely. If you do not really have a nano tank, if you have a nano tank, I would probably say, nah, this is, this is not good on a dosing system, mm -hmm. uh, even the system. Uh, don't put it on dosing. Do it manually, and then it gives you kind of a connection to your tank. You know what you're doing every day, yep. and it, and it's interesting. After a while, people stop looking at uh, the milliliters. They're going to start thinking in micrograms. Mm -hmm. They're going to start understanding the system and feel like, oh, man, I can compare my tank. I dose whatever, five micrograms of iron or whatever, and, and, and I can compare it with my, my buddy, you know, Francis or Mike, how mm -hmm. much he's going to dose. And it kind of helps people to understand getting behind the chemistry a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, nano version, definitely, if you have a nano, do it daily. If you mm -hmm. want to do things on pumps, and if you have a nano, I would say don't do it. What about uh, a big tank with dosing pumps? 100, yeah, 80, 100 gallons, um, I've, I think, depending on what dosing system you have, you can, you can definitely do that on dosing pumps. And um, I think most of the dosing systems can handle less than one milliliter per day now. Yeah, uh, per dose. I think the verses can do like 0.01 of a mil or something super duper tiny. Uh, uh, so, uh, like 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 four or five years ago, there was barely anything other than the DOS system that could really handle small amounts. It has to be one milliliter at least. And that actually triggered my my idea to dose it like one milliliter per hundred gallon. Mm -hmm. It should match the most dosing pump systems yep. out there. Makes sense. Kind of. That was a was a fault. But but just throwing it out there, daily dosing, you're like, oh, one point one five. That's it. In the tank, no, there's an element. In. It's it's really quick and easy. When one one thing is when uh, when when people come, um, you you're gonna get the dose. Uh, you, you're gonna get your, your bottle, right? And you open it up, and what you do is you're gonna have this bottle stopper, yep. which is free, by the way, for everything what you dose element. And so a lot of people throw these things away. They don't know what they are for. So <laughs> so you take this here and you put it in your bottle. So now. Makes your life easy, no spills, and the, the syringe that is coming with it, you can just easily, like a doctor, you know, you look really professional when you when your wife is looking, you're gonna be like, oh, gonna, she's gonna be like, what are you doing there? And then you basically can 
almost spill free, easily dose your, your stuff without stop making a mess. Yeah. What you notice then, when you want to put this thing here on this cap, it doesn't immediately fit. You're going to have to take something um, like a Texas pocket knife, for example, right? <laughs> and take out this little cap. And what you find, there's this little ceiling cap in here for, for transportation purposes. And it keeps the bottle sealed. And you just take it out and from that point on, ready yeah. for the shelf and oh. ready for use next time. A lot of people don't even do it anymore. They leave the syringe like just... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the syringe is my cap. And then you just walk up, flip it, suck yeah. it out, put it in, it's quick and yeah. easy. And even yeah. I still slack some days, but and, I think yeah, I every every element that you could dose daily mm -hmm. um, is actually supplied with a syringe every time and a bottle stopper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and, uh, there are some bottle stoppers on um, on Amazon. Be careful they are different. They have like a hole. Uh, the syringe would fit, but it, it doesn't stop the bottle from dripping, actually. Mm, gotcha. Well, it, it doesn't drip with the needle in it, so leave it in there for storage. You're not going to cross-contaminate. It's ready to roll. That's, that, that's that, what I like. Yeah, that was actually the, uh, one of the reasons, because these um, you don't really want to have uh, air exchange in the bottles too much, mm. because that would degrade the elements over time, since they are being used up so little per day. They last a very long time. Um, Cross-contamination with bacteria is what makes uh, makes the lifetime shorter, as well as oxidation with the environment. So these sealers kind of seal the bottle up. It helps handling and also makes the, the bottle lasting longer. Perfect. Excellent. So as long as it doesn't stink or has any particles floating around in there, you're good. It lasts forever-ish? It lasts almost forever, yeah. Perfect. Well, I say on my website, you know, you should replace the bottles after two years because I can't really predict how badly people handle their stuff. Um, so I'm going until they run out. The but smell at it. If it stinks, <laughs> it's probably not good anymore. Uh, and I, uh, the concentrations of these elements are so high that um, I could avoid a lot of chemicals in there to make them stabilize or to, you know, make them lasting longer. Uh, sometimes you open uh, chemis chemicals for your reef tank and you open the bottle and you smell it, it's, it's like it's like mouthwash, right? And it's like, ah, that can't be good, right? Just yeah. in order to, to make it uh, to make it uh, stable for a while. Nah, mm -hmm. not a friend of that. That's fair. But yeah, no, when it's probably been more than six months, I don't know, whenever I originally did it, I read the handbook a few times and but and then it made me realize that I need to really deal with my nutrients and I got the nutrients in check yeah, and yeah, then yeah. I started doing it but um, the big thing I noticed is it just makes me pay more attention to little things especially when you're walking up even if it's your two minutes to dose it you just take that extra time to like pay attention to little things or tank yeah. where you might gloss yeah. over it normally. One, one thing is <clears throat> there's so many programmers out there I have a lot of you know all, all the, the Reef Moonshiner community which is absolutely great right mm -hmm. and we have this group all Almost no drama, uh, and really for a group of that size, there's it's very little drama, in, which is really good. And it, but it, um, it kind of keeping an eye on who is really going into the group uh, to keep trolls away and stuff like this. So um, the uh, where was I? Completely lost it. Um, drama group methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. So. Um, it it, it, it it kind of worked out really well with that group to, to, to gain so much experience on, on, on certain things on the method that uh, yeah that it, that it, it, it really benefits everyone uh, in, 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 in numerous aspects of, of the hobby mm -hmm. and uh, it, it, it really it really it really helps to be successful. It doesn't matter if you're a new guy or an, a more experienced guy. I have so many guys in there that are kind of already like 20 years along, like since the hobby, and they're starting the method and they're starting the, the methodology and the, and, the, and the product, and they see dramatic changes on the systems. Mm -hmm. Just within a, which within a few months, okay, of course, it, yep. things don't, uh, you know, doesn't happen over and overnight. Uh, some things take take a little bit of time to. Uh, to, to happen but overall uh, you should you should definitely see improvements after a while yep definitely brian can you use tropic marine all free for the moonshine sure could 
What was the question? If you can use all for reef with moonshine. Yeah, any dosing system is going to work, right? Yeah, 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 sure. Yep. Nope, definitely. Yeah. This is but, uh, filling in the, all the uh, gaps from the dosing system. Yeah, one, one, of, one, of, the, uh, one of the questions earlier was um, regarding, regarding trace elements. There's a lot of... I recommend really to use pure or not nothing that really combines numerous uh, alkalinity and calcium parts with other trace elements because what the experience is that over time some of these elements in there kind of start to creeping up and then it's 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 really hard to get them down other than with a water change or find a workaround for these uh, tanks that are loaded with uh, corals have less issues because the consumptions are so high that you potentially don't even see that there is a specific element up, you know, creeping up. But if you have like a, a relatively fresh tank with a lot of sticks in there, then you're gonna you're gonna see potentially issues when you use uh, alkalinity two parts that do contain also a lot of other trace elements. And you really have to watch whatever product you use. Look on the backside and see what's in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that, that basically will help you to, to see if there's any risk on it. So my recommendation is use the purest one, the least uh, trace elements are in there, the better, to kind of keep things really clean and controlled. So yep. nothing really can creep up by using these supplements. No, that makes sense. Less potential additives building up over time. Um, now, I know this is mainly for the sticks and the acros. There was a few questions chat earlier of if it's beneficial for... Or I guess how beneficial for like LPS and other types of coral? Well, <clears throat> there was a myth like years back. You couldn't keep, uh, um, you know, zoas and torches and shrooms together with acroporas, you know, SPS dominated tanks. And it was truly very, very difficult to deal with. Um, what I found out actually is that it is possible especially nowadays, because almost every product we have out there has trace element in there as well. Um, the SPS taking up so many of these metals, potentially because of their high surface uh, area of each coral, that they are kind of out-competing on taking away these minor metals, uh, what, the, what the zoos and, and shrooms and soft corals actually need. So we, uh, I think the dominating, dominating species are mostly SPS. That is why we had so much trouble in the past to, to have uh, a nice mixed reef with LPS, SPS, many, many sewers, and a lot of acros in there. So what I would, with, that was actually one of the reasons why we, um, the four daily elements are dosed on a daily basis. That are, but these are really in there every day in small amounts. And that's all what is needed. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, they they going away so quick that you have to do it ideally on a daily basis. Yep. So. Unless you're going to go on vacation, you have two choices. You leave them off for a week and let the tank behind, right? Or just dose in advance sort of thing. That means you buffer up for like two, three days. And then you, when soon you're going to come back from vacation, you keep continuing as you do. Yeah. I have tend to just... They're like right off those few days and just start up again when I'm back and then I, I saw earlier in the chat actually there was a discussion about the rubidium mm -hmm. um, and uh, well rubidium is an element that again there's nothing proven there's no scientific evidence out there but there's so much observation and feedback on rubidium that it makes soft corals fluffy. It makes, wow. you know, LPS puffing, puffing up. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes sewers, uh, the metabolism, uh, metabolism of, of sewers is, is so much enhanced. They, they grow quicker. They, they puff up. Um, it, is, it is truly an, uh, a really, really, really uh, almost proven experience from, from everyone in the group and on all these users. And there were numerous people. What happened was they bought all the elements, and they were, they were waiting for the tests. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't wait, of course, you know. So un impatient as we are, uh, they started do dosing already their rubidium corrections. Yep. You know, that's the only thing what they did, because that's what they could start doing it mm -hmm. without even having the test results in hand. And if you read the, hand the Muta handbook, you know why. Um, so, and they observed a lot of, lot of times that after the rubidium initial correction dose, that they are all their zoos and soft calls did do so much better, really, literally overnight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen really on every tank, 
Um, and the reason for that is, I believe, some tanks do have still sufficient or some rubidium left from whatever state they are. Uh, but a lot of tanks kind of over time, they just run out of rubidium because rubidium is a very expensive trace element and hence uh, not very often being supplemented in, in most most salts. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to look at some of the ingredients list of some salts, very high grade uh, salts do have some rubidium in there, but it depletes no matter what. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely one that you have to correct. So I don't know if you have seen my videos. I have this, this, uh, this beanbag humor. Oh, well, the big really goldy one? Yeah, the, the, the orange orange, oh, the orange one. And every time I do my... Uh, actually, I, I started doing um, like weekly corrections, daily corrections, and monthly. And um, daily is doing the, the best. And after after dosing, like five minutes after, you can really see how the bounces are all popping up and really mm -hmm. coming up. And that is the perfect timing. Right? Take a picture of it. So it looks so awesome, right? And it gets, uh, whatever, four million clicks on YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, it's a beautiful or Instagram mushroom. Or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah rubidium is is, is 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 having some very significant impact and effects. Oh, I found the, your, I just found your video on it. Hold it up. The colors on that thing are crazy. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. Yeah, it's definitely a beauty. Um, uh, there was a few questions the last few minutes asking about the blocks and the bricks, and some of them are asking about aluminum. But what's what's your thoughts on those media bricks for basically Ooh, adding more surface yeah. area? Well, there's a lot of biomedia out there, right? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these biomedia they utilize something to basically like a, like a, like a cement, right? To mm -hmm. to keep the, the structure and the materials together. Uh, without naming, calling out any brands, um, there are some media that as soon as they are getting too dirty and too anaerobic, mm -hmm. it seems like they're becoming too acidic inside. And that is potentially what's causing an oxidation process so that the material inside will start to dissolve. And you kind of see that when you when you take your thumb and you press on the bio blocks or whatever, you can see you can start to, you know, to, to smash them in your fingers. Yeah. Um, something what I also observed is uh, Ciporax Pond, which I am a big fan of usually. Yeah, that's a popular Ciporax one. Ciporax Pond is a great piece of filtration media for reef tanks. It is not promoted to be used for reef tanks by the manufacturer, really, because it has some 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 risky side effects. One of them is if if Ciporax becomes too dirty and becomes uh, or gets into an, a really anaerobic environment, like a reactor, mm -hmm. uh, and it has not enough flow, and you know it clogs up too much. It, it seems to when it becomes anaerobic, it seems to release all the silicates. Hmm. But, Potentially keeps it together. So I have I have observed that from numerous people now, all the same situation, all almost the same situation because no tank is really the same as each other. Mm -hmm. But it is it's it's very obvious that as soon the seaporax becomes anaerobic, means you know absence of oxygen, yeah. uh, the bacteria uh, and the, the hydrogen sulfide, you know, it's gonna it's gonna build up inside even inside the pores. And that's causing a very destructive environment for that media, and that is when uh, potentially this media starts to leaching silicates. Um, other uh, media are known to leach. Actually, I don't want to say leach because it potentially leaching out because something is dissolving inside the media. Mm -hmm. um, aluminium, aluminium. It's it's yeah. it's one of our yeah hmm. one big problem. So. Uh, all the media out there so far utilize, or almost all of them, utilize something um, to promote bacteria growth. Mm -hmm. Some of them are sulfide loaded. So as soon as you run out of sulfide, you know, the effectiveness of that biomedia is gone as well. Yeah. So I personally don't use too much or any biomedia, to be honest, up, except the, the Ciporax a little bit. But just for the cause of having some different environment, for specific bacteria available because mm -hmm. you want to have really like a lot of different substrates in your tank to allow different bacteria strains to grow. Yeah. Some of them will grow here but not there. So it's kind of every animal needs its own little home. Bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the same with them. They need many different environments to, to thrive yep. and to, to live. Now, with the Zibrax, do you kind of like shake it out once in a while or give it a rinse once in a while, something to like clean up? 
to yeah. prevent that the best, situation? <laughs> the best way, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very controversial. There is, uh, the, in my opinion, the best way I arrange seed products is actually you, you stack it in a basket mm -hmm. and you put it not in the vertical, you put it in the horizontal and let the flow going through this way. And uh, that's typically possible, um, like in, like between right where the entry is, where the all water goes in after the socks, going towards the next stage where you are your skimmer is or whatever, mm -hmm. or uh, try to put it somewhere in a sump section with a power head that it kind of you know flows the water through these columns of of sea products. Yeah. Um, I was using sea products as well. In in uh, I took an old uh, vibe reactor. And you know, yeah. took half an eye to stack it all up nicely, and uh, that worked really well. It was a lot of flow going through this reactor, and I ran the vibe function. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, kept me the sea products clean. It was running in a dark stand, so there was not much algae growth uh, in that reactor. And I also had the opportunity to, in the, in, on the inlet of a, the pump, I, I put a dosing pump with uh, carbohydrates on it that even did dose some carbohydrates straight into that reactor. Yeah. So that worked to some extent. It destroyed nutrients so far pretty well. Uh, but at the end, I ended up with still too much phosphate, so it wasn't really able to completely maintain my, my, my phosphate mm -hmm. levels. Yeah, Phos phosphate ones has always been a bit of a bugger for me. I've always had to use, like, I just put GFO or roll phos back on because I'm like, hey, got to knock it back down because it's slowly like creeping up. Yeah. It's always that well, way. I tell you, phosphate, phosphate management is the most challenging thing on in yeah in a reef tank, even if you're an experienced reefer. Uh, so many times I talk with Mike Paletta about ideas, you know, how to manage our our phosphates. Mm -hmm. um, and he did he did actually a study. You need maybe you know you guys should should have a look at it. He did a study where he looked uh, at at 20 different reef tanks and he compared all summer long all sorts of parameters. When he was done with it, he also looked into different foods and how much phosphate you go into uh, introduce into your tank. Yeah. And when he presented me his, his data so far, it was quite shocking that uh, with that little bit of feeding, what you actually do on a daily rate, right. it's how much phosphorus and phosphate you actually introduce to your tank. So my personal opinion is, first, try to avoid GFO. That is what I try to avoid. Yeah. Um, I rather prefer um, a no-pox, actually, red mm -hmm. no -pox, to maintain your to maintain your phosphate, and it really works. But in some tanks, it causes issues where it, it promotes the wrong bacteria, and then you're going to have some, some issues, white bacteria grow, or RTN issues, things like this, like carbohydrates do in general, right? They mm -hmm. fuel bacteria. They fuel the good, and they fuel the bad. Yeah. So no pox is my first choice for most of the cases, and if it works, great. If it causes issues, it's basically um, GFO. Mm -hmm. If it bleaches corals, I personally try really to stay away of it. If you have to use GFO, I personally recommend use use it gentle, really gentle, and not too much. Take your time. Uh, don't drop your phosphate levels too fast. Um, I observed with with su supplementing phosphorus or removing it, 0.02 per day is really the maximum what you should you shouldn't exceed. Um, 0.02 is already sometimes very critical. Uh, don't go over it. So if you use a massive amount of, of GFO, you strip 0.5 you know, or 0.05, and you, you you're causing causing quite some issues on your tank. So what I'm yep. not a fan for at all, I would never ever lantano chloride. Product I was going to ask you about that one. An absolutely no no. I yeah. I'm a. Uh, it's just. It's the biotoxicity is just too high. I, I, I don't I don't I don't like that at all because it, it's such a poison for our animals, and also what is even worse, it it's been it's been presented so easy to use mm -hmm. that people do not take the right precautionary steps to apply it really correctly. Right? You you should you should have a drop going into the water. It starts to flocculate. It you know takes the phosphate, and then it needs to be removed. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't even get a get a chance to, to to turn anywhere, and 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 people that are long, long enough in the hobby and have done some lanthanum chloride products will realize that oh man, it's almost impossible 
to to make this happen on your tank. So you you end up with lanthanum chloride in your tank, potentially never get it completely out, and you do somewhat of a harm to your to your corals mm-hmm. without even realizing it. And you know if if even people like Sanjay right. Uh, sometimes do slightly mistakes where they still measure lanthanum chloride in their water, that means something. These guys are really, really professional and very careful with what they do on their tanks. And, uh, yeah, I, I, that's something that I would not do at all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So and, uh, avoid yeah, that. Ketamorphine algae yep. is, is, is another nice thing to, to use, mm-hmm. but it's not, in my opinion, even used in a reactor or in a refugium. It never really... Uh, you know, resolve the complete PO4 absorption. Now, so deep sand bed is your first choice? My first your choice tank is in, deep, deep, deep sand bed. Yeah. Deep sand bed. I've never actually tried a deep sand bed before. Yeah. So, what, okay, so what would be your second choice for PO4? Water box will run on a deep sand bed as well, yeah. a remote deep sand bed, and yeah. If it doesn't work, I have to correct my statement here, but let's <laughs> see in a few months. Yep. So if it's not enough, assume it takes up a third of your phosphates. What would you use to deal with the rest of it? Uh, I would probably utilize Ketamorpha, right? Yep. It's, it's when my it's next edition. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is, is space. You don't have enough space to, you know, have this um, huge amount of... of, of of Kato in the tank, um, G- potentially GFO or zeolite. Yeah. If it's a temporary thing and I only need to reduce it because I know my sandpit can handle it mm-hmm. and I just had an accident spike, I use uh, zeolite in a little filter bag, put it in a mesh bag yeah. at where my filter socks usually are and just absorb it for like a you know, few days, mm-hmm. measure my uh, phosphorus on a daily basis and my phosphates and um, yep. see how it comes down. Yeah, sure. I'm going to try the whole Z-Lite rocks one day. I've never tried those. So. And, and uh, what I typically start with is roughly like you use, <sighs> how much is it? It's like half of these bags from, from like Koralensucht, yep. half a bag per 100 gallon. Okay. It's, uh, it's a good amount you can start with. Okay. And you put it somewhere in a high flow area so they remain clean. Similar mm-hmm. to Zebra rocks, the uh, zeolite surface need to remain clean. So as soon as we have bacteria slime on top of it, it makes it a little bit less effective yep. from the absorption capacity. It blocks all those pores. No, that makes sense. Um, okay, other random question for you. Uh, you said you use mesh filter socks. Oh, your cardiac can answer, I guess, using the power filter. Um, I was going to say if you're in the camp of like crystal clear water, filter all those particles, or if you like them floating around for the corals. Well, like I said, it's a little bit counterproductive, right? Mm-hmm. I, I like the crystal clear, the crisp water, um, but the crisp water is still loaded with particles, food particles, large food particles, like, you know, like what, what I used to use a lot is uh, Tropic Marine Photon. Yep. Uh, can you see that? No, it's focused on your face. <laughs> Phyton and Zuton, these yep. two products um, I recently started to use, and they have a, a really, really well reaction on most of the corals. Um, try to use a lot of these dry foods, because um, I'm using vitamins as well, but these two dry foods causing quite a great uh, uh, yeah, feeding response. Nice. So, yeah, again, it's counterproductive. You do strip out stuff with a power filter. Yeah. Because you want to have a water clarity, you mm-hmm. want to have this visual appearance, this nice one, and you want to have a light penetration and the best out of your spectrum. But at the same time, you know... It's you also taking out those little bits of good stuff as well. It's a trade-off. And I... it, it, it is a trade-off. Yeah. What, uh, what the nice thing is of a power filter is even if it get, you, know, you have it running in your tank, if you turn it off, mm-hmm. nothing's going to happen. It is mm-hmm. aerobic at this point in time. It doesn't start fouling or I mean start fouling of course inside but it, it doesn't really cause an issue like an, like a carbon reactor if you have an activated carbon reactor and you turn it off mm-hmm. for half a day or a day you're going to be in trouble when you restart it that power filter is 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 still in the water motion of your yep. tank so it's nothing really badly mm-hmm. happen with a power filter yep. so what 
when when the tank looks too clean and it, I I you know I lose all my food particles within an hour and they're all gone, mm -hmm. then I still can say you know Apex put this thing on a timer, and uh, when I'm at home and I want to see the tank you know you're gonna you're gonna stop. Yep. No, well, that makes sense. I if I did want to probably hide it in the sump just so I didn't see the big thing on it, but. Anyway. And I and I actually did uh, I did some video footage for my mm -hmm. YouTube channel where I put uh, where I looked under the microscope the outside of a power filter mm -hmm. and the inside I took the water stream from the running pump put that under the microscope and then you can see before and after yeah right and you can see all these microorganisms that are not there anymore and whatever's going through even in the inner part of this of this filter fleece mm -hmm. uh, you can see it's all dead it's not moving anymore yeah so it's. Um, Kind of so. shows the effect. Nice. And they also work extremely well for new tanks and clearing out all the sand clouds. <laughs> yeah. Actually, while I was filling up my water box tank, yeah. I put a, a, a power filter in there just to get rid of all this dust, you know, where it's always mm -hmm. blending the tank. Yep, exactly. I've done my little DIY ones to deal with that too and clears the water in no time, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, and if people uh, like don't like that power filter in the display tank, um, give it a try. Put it in your sump and, and let it run there. The thing mm -hmm. is, it steers up the sump. It means it cleans the, the you know, it steers up the detritus. It makes your sump a little bit cleaner, uh, which reduces the amount of, of, of acid in your tank as well mm -hmm. and uh, helps the biology a little bit if you keep this detritus away from your from your from your bottom areas so, without substrate <laughs> and, and you know and it, it keeps stuff clean so would would the detritus in your sump add to the acidity of your water well i yeah i barely could understand you oh. kind of it okay. was bad what repeated with, oh because you're saying it will help with the acidity so would the tri detritus and all like that bit sitting in the bottom of your sump would that add to the acidity of your tank well, I read a couple of things uh, about biology and 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 how bacteria works and how f like certain foul you know acids from fouling process are developing. Mm -hmm. And um, when you do have these decomposing organic material just sitting on the tank bottom, and it just sits there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it sits there for a long time. People see typically like an accumulation of that stuff, yeah. right? It, uh, it 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 decomposes not well and not fast enough. Okay. Um, if you have it within like a certain media, like live rocks and or sand or, or gravel, it decomposes faster, and um, that helps to 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 to. The, the, the breakdown process it helps the breakdown process if that stuff sits there to, for too long um what i understood from these articles they were really really complicated and hard to read um that there are certain foul gases are produced that causing also a, like a sort of an effect on your on your ph on your tank due mm -hmm. to acids that are to being produced yep. by the bacteria as an as an yeah well as a, a bad byproduct all these little things you wouldn't consider, but yeah, I, it makes sense when you think about it. But it's just off first hand you would think of them. Why? Uh, well, also you always use like a high amount of aerobic filtration mm -hmm. in order to get the ammonia processed as best as possible. And the best way to do that is aerobic filtration. Mm -hmm. Means live rock is not a good thing because it's that's it's. It's relatively small on the surface area. The best way is these days, or you know, the old days, is like trickle filter type of things, mm -hmm. which nobody has these days anymore, and are really hard to maintain. But these biofilters, where water just goes through a, um, um, a self-cleaning biofilter system, that is that is helping a lot to get ammonia reduced and mm -hmm. nitrate reduced into nitrate. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Quickly. Quickly, quickly is the key. And that actually helps also the pH. Mm. Because the more ammonia you have in your tank, the, the worse your pH is. More suppressed. Now, I'm not going to lie, I haven't we tested talk about ammonia. Ammonia levels really in ultra low ranges. We do not talk about ammonia in like when you do the titration. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about really like PPBs below PP, very, very okay. low, low ranges. Yeah, I was going to say, that's also the guy I don't think I've tested with since I originally cycled it. It's been ages. 
Yeah. When I do some of the videos on my YouTube channel, um, I'm going to put a Sennai um, ammonia meter mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the water box because I need it for the quick cycle yep. to see to see how quick I can uh, get through the first part of the cycle, which is taking care of ammonia first, getting it all converted into nitrate quick enough. And now uh, you, you measure basically in the ultra low range to what your ammonia is. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it hits below one PPB, you're good to go, and then you can do whatever you want, and you can introduce basically stuff as long as you don't have any excessive nitrates in there. Yep. No, definitely. Yeah. So what's your YouTube channel? Reef Moon Shiners? Is that what... Yeah, Reef Moon Shiners uh, yep. on YouTube. That's, that's the channel it's going to be. And the reason for that channel is actually I have so many followers and so many users. Um, they need mentoring, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I can mentor like 20, 30, 40 people. Uh, but now it's thousands of people and getting, you know, my way out and helping people uh, on certain subjects that are repeatedly the same, the same questions over and over and over again. Um, I think the best way to do it is to yeah, pu publish videos on it and just 100%. get through that done. And, you know, when people ask a question in the group, hey, how is this? Well, how would you do that? Blah, you just, you know, post the link and you know, out of a YouTube video. Yeah. They're going to watch it and they're going to have enough information how to how to deal with it. And all that stuff actually is supposed to have and uh, subjects that are outside of a Moonshiners method itself, mm -hmm. um, but are still, you know, challenging thing in the uh, in the hobby, basically, especially yeah. for 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 new for new reefers. Mm -hmm. What I noticed over the last few years is that a lot of literature is is going away, and 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 Facebook and forums and Reddit and all this good stuff, you know. It's, it's taking over and it's what educating people right now. We, we're living in a, in a very fast moving world and mm -hmm. people barely have time to, after work, to read books and, you know, get into this, you know, like in the detail, uh, like, you know, the old school yep. reefers normally would do, right? Uh, yep. we, we, had to, we had to do learn everything we had to build our own plumbing had to had to read a lot and we're a little bio bio scientists you know almost uh, in order to run your reef tanks nowadays mm -hmm. you go to a shop you're going to have everything ready you're going to buy it it's going to be shipped to your house and you just connect four pipes and a pump and there you go put a light on top of it and here's your <laughs> reef tank but there's a lot of experience missing uh, what these people will never learn really mm -hmm. other than when it's already too late uh, when you have almost a crash or whatever, and you lose corals and animals. So to prevent that, it's, it's, there's a couple of subjects that need to be handled and mentored yeah. uh, to this new generation. And I think uh, videos and articles on one website, this is the way to go. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. I find majority of people these days yeah. are just YouTube So I don't want to be a YouTuber kind of uh, doing my, you know, weekly... You're, you're turning weekly, into it. It's coming. You know, stuff like this. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it looks a little bit... So I, I stole a little bit of the, of the, uh, of the environment of, of YouTubers and gamers and, uh, and got some ideas and talked a lot with these guys because the... Like videography and 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 live streaming, it's a it's a it's a hobby on its own, and it's it's expensive, and it takes a lot of education. Yep. So I I did the same as people did with me. You know, I just asked the pros, and hey, how do you do this? How do you do that? What what? Mm -hmm. How do I get progress pretty quickly without really learning for years, right? Uh, and I think um, it it pays back. You you give and you take. Yeah. It's uh, it's a good trade. Well, your, your audio is great. Your camera is nice and crisp. You got the nice background. You're ready for it. You're set. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, the thing is, I have so many ideas, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm just running out of time. I mean, I'm a normal person, right? Mm -hmm. um, you run your normal job. You run the reef moon shiners. You run the group. You run the product. Uh, my wife helps me a lot on that. Mm -hmm. And um, now doing these videos, uh, it's, it's it's very time consuming, and it's uh, you learn a lot, and you have to learn a lot, especially if you want to present yourself in a certain quality. And I'm probably too much of an of an uh, perfectionist, so I probably been far too hard on myself. I have so much footage I need to edit and I need to make, and I'm never happy with it. And uh, it's, it's, it's just terrible. It's terrible. And I'm moving on so fast. You know, the tank is almost full. I have three hours of video footage. I need to make a video out of it. Yep. And I just don't have the time for that. So, 
And um, like like there's a like um, inappropriate reefer. Mm -hmm. He's also from China's. Uh, he's used YouTube uh, YouTube channel actually. Uh, I really love it. And uh, but he also uh, had to you know step down. He couldn't do this anymore weekly as he did. And I really liked his 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 real life person videos as he did. Yep. And uh, yeah, I will probably not have a time to be on that level like these guys or like you having a like a weekly show you know to to talk about things really the uh reef moon channel channel is really just so mostly for for supporting yep well so uh about half my videos supporting the just... group, supporting the community yep. with good subjects and uh yeah i think my last video that i posted it was really a mess i posted uh i was trying to do a footage everything ready and i, I did like these you beanbag humors and i fracked them and the camera tilted down while i was was oh, no. and already recorded it was like my hairy arms you know <laughs> and uh, it yep. sucked <laughs> well, yeah it, it happens okay so about half my videos are based off common questions i get so i mean ideally that would be perfect for what you're doing right all the yeah, common yeah, stuff you yeah. answer create a video that it's just a resource to help all those yeah. Yeah. common stuff it's a good way to go yep i think so i have uh, quite a few things and first what i want to do is i want to do an introduction video of a mm -hmm. like a quick a quick guide of, of how reef moon channels works yep. the second video is probably going to be about the water bags how to cycle and things like this kind of to get this thing done so i have space on my hard drive again and then i want to have a comprehensive video which probably going to take like an hour or two mm -hmm. maybe even multiple parts about all the stuff what we talked here briefly i want to really go into the detail have an edited video Video ready where a person can sit in front of, a, of, of YouTube you know, on this big flat screen TV watch watch the show and watch the video and after he watched the video he should be able to for the most part fully understand the method yep. the product what's all behind it why to do this because nobody really asks why to, and, and how it really works mm -hmm. just everyone's asking you know, you know how to apply it but nobody really asks what does it really do to your course um, so what does it do well, it, it improves the coloration. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, you will be surprised. I have barely anyone asking that question. Why does it work? Mm -hmm. And um, I, what I, what I would, what I sometimes do, I send links. Um, there is an, there is a, an article series from Dana Riddle, mm -hmm. and it's called Reef Nutrition Part One to Part Six. Strongly recommend to look that up. Okay. Um, he did a fantastic job and explained some of the requirements for corals in terms of chemistry, light, food, even amino acids, even while I'm not a friend of amino acids, to be honest, uh, and some other stuff. And it really explains very nicely what some of these elements do to the coral, uh, because all what they do, they are needed in order to photosynthesize uh, and make the met metabolic processes working. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do between the coral host, which is the animal, and their tissue, which is a plant, there's a lot of processes between these two organisms. And they all need something. And to be honest, a lot of these processes and what these elements do are not even fully understood, even at this point. Mm -hmm. They kind of have an idea and there are some observations and recommendations, but what's really fully going to happen inside the coral is still uh, a very unknown uh, thing. Mm -hmm. for, for especially for the reef keeping community when I, when when you read newer articles from uh from marine biologist institutes you kind of getting a feel this is the feeling i get we are kind in the reefing community we are kind of five to seven years behind what actually the scientific world have already uh observed and you know uncovered mm -hmm. kind of what uh, what what it feels like yeah we're doing right now we're going to do a lot of wake up on microbiome bacteria uh, in the water on the coral in the coral uh, that is going to you know cause quite a lot of confusion people in the industry that, that deal with products on that like uh, aquabiomics for example mm -hmm. they're going to have to <laughs> they're going to have to make this thing to make sense for the audience that is everything is far too complicated to understand for most people mm -hmm. and people when the people don't understand it they're going to stay away from it and they say ah no 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 i don't need all that yeah my, my body's tank looks great i do the same as he does you know? 
I mean, if it works, it works at the end of the day. <laughs> well, but this buddy is potentially, you know, somebody who, who understands all that and he does, does all sort of testing and then, and, 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 you know, the little secrets. <laughs> yep. Well, that's the thing, right? There, there's knowing it and then there's just replicating something that you know works. You yeah, don't, yeah. I don't know why, but you just know you do this and then things seem to be happy to so keep doing yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if, if, if there's a lot of people, um, I mean, over the last two years, uh, the, the method and the product rapid, rapidly increased, and it, it keeps going like this, and I'm, I'm constantly ramping up for my end as well, and um, it's like an avalanche. It's like people telling other people, that, you know, showing their tanks, and they... Uh, uh, other people get interested and they're going to ask questions or just look in the group and, you know, look at all this information that's now online available and jump on board and, and telling later on other people. And it's, 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 it's crazy. It's really crazy. The nice thing is that it really works for, for almost everyone. Uh, there are sometimes people that are not really that happy, but when I started digging deeper and I recognize that they have still an issue, we sometimes uncover yeah, basically some things, mostly on the biology, mm -hmm. that really disturbing and keeping them back from from success, yeah. or or something is is wrong on a on a very exotic other side. And I have seen, you know, due to that experience, I have seen a lot of things that that can go wrong actually. Yeah, I mean, I mean, generally you got your lighting, your flow, and your water chemistry, and water chemistry is its own subset, right? But yeah. it's everything has to be happy in order to see all the benefits it's something else out of whack you kind of got to deal with that first yeah it's light is important and your fine tuning is done with a spectrum your chemistry has to be in check it really has to be in check but even if you have a perfect chemistry mm -hmm. your tank will not succeed if you don't have your biology in check and i'm not talking about simply having nutrients managed in mm -hmm. a in an acceptable range it's more it's, it's much more on the biology it's we most people don't even know, well, you know, when you talk about nutrients, they think mm -hmm. like, oh, it's phosphate and it's it's nitrate. No, it's, first of all, it's phosphorus, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's the NPK ratio and not the NPO4, you know, K ratio. Um, it's it's, it's the, the, the phosphate, phosphorus issue. It's, uh, it's ammonia, nitrate in low ranges. All these things also have a lot of impact on the tank. They are mostly... They can only they they almost can be ignored because they are very rarely causing an issue. Mm -hmm. But well, the few people that are not successful mostly have these exotic issues that they run bare bottom, all their rock is cemented. You know, they barely mm -hmm. have any bio media in there. Um, vaccine, you know, a bad vaccinated tank to begin with with bacteria strains. Yep. And that causes so much issues and um, like, you know, dino just it's, oh my gosh, so many of these new reefers have issues with, uh, with dinos. And do, you, do you think, do you think I, that is just a lack of like a solid bacteria foundation or diversity? <laughs> Well, it's biodiversity. It's your bacterial and mm -hmm. microfauna biodiversity is not mature enough, not diverse enough to to take away from that dinos what they use to thrive. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I had I had dealt with this dino flagellate. In my case, it was Osteopsis and some other stalking diatoms and chrysophytes and shit like this. I had all that stuff in the tank for my, and I tried really everything. Yeah. And at the end, I said, you know what? It's enough. It's enough. I'm going to do go old school. And I did the correction. And I make a video about this because it needs a little bit of attention how you do that, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be very dangerous. And two, three days later, all the dinos were gone, all mm -hmm. this weird algae were gone, all the cyanos started to disappear, the tank looked like a normal reef tank, corals were of course recovering nicely, mm -hmm. and when I checked then under the microscope what happened, I found a lot of critters that were just not there before. I knew them from my previous tanks, uh, but starting doing this with a, with a, with a, yeah, a, 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 a very, very, very sterile tank, uh, there's a lot of stuff missing. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff missing. Yeah, I think it takes a while to build up diversity or and break it in through frags or other sources to slowly well, 
there are some people who are saying, oh, I started my tank sterile as well with dry dock and it was as happy as it can be. Mm -hmm. Well, the last case I, I had, I was really questioning that and uh, I found out at the end, this guy had, yes, it was a sterile tank, all dry rocks, uh, just quick cycled and then he put in mariculture corals, but tons of mariculture corals in there. And each coral had a big block of uh, reef cement on it coming mm -hmm. from the ocean. Yeah. So, well, guess what? These, you know, 50, 60 blocks were full of microfauna from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have to run through any of these Dino issues or some other ugly, ugly issues. And uh, yeah, also what I noticed is a lot of people are gr grabbing bottles too quick for fixing something. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I do see this like, uh, TV remote operator mentality, kind of, okay, I, you know, there's a little bit of algae growing in my sandbag. Oh, I'm going to pour in this. Oh, there's a little bit of red here. Oh, I'm going to pour in this. Mm -hmm. uh, I would strongly recommend not to do that. Try to no. educate yourself and, 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 and do something naturally first yep. um, before you grab the bottle. Because at some point, especially with some of the ano species, there's nothing that can help you anymore because the harmful algae bloom or a cyano outbreak is just too bad. Then you have to say, okay, harm your tank with chemically or harm your tank with uh, with that cyano toxins. Uh, and then you have to, you have to, yeah. you know, look at the, what, what's, the, what's the best way. Now, what is your thoughts on the bottles, but of different bacteria to try and you know, manually well, add diversity. Well, I, I bought literally every yeah. bottle of bacteria on this planet that you can buy in every country. And well, to be honest, even under a microscope, and I, and I had actually had to, to had to um, talk to, uh, had to send some samples to a friend of mine who has the opportunity to have access to an, um, a sample. So the, the microbiological diversity of a natural reef or, you know, live rock, true live rock, mm -hmm. you cannot make happen with with all these all these all these bacteria cocktails out there these are artificially bred you mm -hmm. know uh, they are, they are, they are, yes they are maybe natural species but not in a diversity as we as we have it in 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 the ocean and um, what what I also saw is what what kicked the dinos butts almost was these uh, microorganisms not not bacteria it was like like little little critters like worms worms type of things there's a lot of 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 of, uh, of of stuff what i what i did see which i knew from my previous tanks which i did not see uh, on this lagoon tank where while i had this this Osteopsis outbreak yeah so it's it's bacteria mm -hmm. and it's all microfauna and, and uh, yeah it's it's a lot of animals in there, a lot of critters, yeah. and uh, just the bacteria itself. I do not believe that you can. There might be some lucky guys that that, that make it happen, and their yeah. their tanks are actually never really exposed to the really bad bacteria for some reason because they are really really clean. But as soon as bad bad frack comes in, you know yeah. you have a bacteria, yeah. and then there you go, party starts. Um, <laughs> There's yeah, it, it's interesting because you could bring something bad in on a frag, but you could also bring in good diversity on like, yeah, a checker. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like when when I had the the Walt the Walt the Walt Smith Fiji mud, mm -hmm. um, I I tried to do that because it has dormant natural bacteria, yep. dormant bacteria, and I read a lot of articles that kind of popped in my mind about like uh, bacteria because I was trying to fix this lagoon tank in the beginning with natural bacteria from the ocean without using live rocks because I was trying to avoid all the hitchhikers, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was trying to do with Walt Smith Fiji mud, which I could get a bucket from. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, I think it's, it's 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 barely sold anywhere anymore. So I took the mud under the microscope first yep. few days, nothing really happened, and then you started seeing under the microscope that you know certain bacteria came out. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you what, some bacteria. I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not a bacteria specialist. Some of them look very very clearly like vibrio, vibrio bacteria. Mm -hmm. So we're looking like sort of our other bacteria and they kind of came came to life slowly. So but yeah again it wasn't enough really to to fix uh, the sterile tank to make it natural. Mm -hmm. 
because there was not enough bacterial diversity and species in there to to establish a natural environment. And it was and think about it, it's all the dirt that goes in the mud at the end, right? That's mm-hmm. what provides there. We we bury our stuff and when we're gonna bring it back up, it's not necessarily the good stuff it comes back up. <laughs> yeah. So it was. It didn't work actually. It it, it helped mm-hmm. to build up more diversity for sure. And I plan on the new water box as soon as it's running. Uh, I'm probably potentially going to put in like I'm going to take a, like a, like one of these pea cups, these yep. fishing containers. I'm going to fill it all up uh, with with a fishing mud, and I mix mm-hmm. it in salt water, and I just pour it into the tank and let it all you know that go works around. Too, I know lots of people that will just dose uh, mud to the tank and let it just go everywhere. <laughs> Turn off my power filter, and then I let this, yep. this, the mud settle everywhere, so these dormant microorganisms can uh, basically wake up mm-hmm. after. It, like I said, it started with like two days, four days, and uh, I talked to some of the uh, microbiologists here in the US with, with dealing with bacteria cultures. They told me that it can take up to like three, four weeks mm-hmm. before even the last ones yeah. going out of the sea. I have. It, it's so hard to gauge how much like some of the stuff actually does on the tank, but I did about a month or two ago. I added a bag of Miracle Mud and a bag of the Aquaforest Mud to my sump, and yeah. then I sent off one of the DNA tests a few weeks later. So I, not now, oh, ideally, I would okay. have one before and after to compare it, which I don't sadly. I just have after, but I'm just curious to see. Okay, how so how many weeks? How many weeks after you put in that 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 aquaforest mud, which is probably the same mud from the Fidgies as the Walt Smith one? I don't know, but I yeah. assume it's. How much time was between seeding and taking the sample? I will scroll back my videos and figure it out later. Because I, okay. I, I know what live stream I'll I decided to do it days. afterwards, and I know when I did the video to do it back. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's an, it's an interesting subject. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, and it's a great subject. But yeah, three to four weeks. So, yeah, that's... Okay, that's yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I'm g- yeah, I'm going to say it was probably three weeks is my guess without knowing 100%. Did, did you send a clean water sample out or did you scrape off both crap from the bottom? Uh, through... Screw it up and then catch it. Yep, um, so one of it was a water sample from the top and you put it through a little filter pad. Yeah. Then you do some fix it stuff to do it, and then another one you scrape off, like you return nozzle somewhere dark, but surfaces where there's high flow. Well, well, I don't know. We'll find out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and that goes back to where do certain bacteria live, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, certain bacteria have you know, certain environments where they live. <clears throat> so if you find potentially you find one species in a piece of piece of life rock or piece of rock, you're going to find it much more than you know, when you scrape it off of a piece of pipe, mm-hmm. potentially. Yep. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture, it's a start. Yeah, I don't know, it'd be interesting. It's still all new information, but the more you find, I think it's, mm-hmm. it'll evolve the hobby eventually as we yeah. learn more, but it's still young. Oh, then there was one thing, uh, I started talking about this when I, when I, when I lost the string. Um, we had uh, a couple of people in the group that were really smart programmers, you know, and they also, they asked me, hey, Andre, we can do something really nice. We can automate the whole process. So that you click a button, you know, and all this test data is going to be transferred to your phone. Now, all that's missing is actually who's somebody who, who does it actually in your tank. Everything is automated. And then I thought a lot about it. And some people even published the links and the data crawler and the tools into the Moonshiner group. So they are hidden somewhere months back. Mm-hmm. Um, you all what you really do, you, you copy and paste your link to your to your to your ICP and you put it in your entry field and it basically replicates your assessment tool. Oh, where's this tool? I need this. It, it's, it's really, it's really, <laughs> but there was a big disadvantage to that, or two actually. One is yeah. people kind of losing their their Fair. familiarity with the elements, right? Yeah. I mean like Think about calcium. If I tell you your calcium level is 680, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, right? Because it's, it's far too high. So when I tell people, hey, you, you know, in your test, your barium is at 520. If somebody knows mm-hmm. what his normal barium levels is are, he would kind of be shocked and he would be alarmed. Yeah. If 
if you know you kind of getting getting a sense for yeah. these other other elements and what these levels are for example copper is when people read copper the first time the newbies on the method they kind of freak, freak out, out when they read copper on their test even if it's just one microgram and i tell them guys don't don't worry you know as long we are stay below 10 on a on a one time case it's it's okay you don't have to worry about this 10 micro program is potentially gone uh, next month anyways if you don't do a water change mm -hmm. however if it keeps crawling up or just barely moves then you may want to have to look you know for certain equipment that's rotting a pump failures or whatever yep so that's one thing you kind of getting a better understanding of of your of your trace elements levels and mm -hmm. you get a sense for it what it really means and then the second con you know concern was since ATI, you know, I'm a customer of ATI. Yeah. I, am not, I don't have any collaboration with them. I, I, there's no affiliation with anyone. So when they change something on their end and this data crawler screws up, bugger everything up. It, it, my my concern was it will it will do something in the tool and the people not understanding what they're doing because they then they're not concerned about a 680 you know calcium level. Yep. They're gonna start dosing certain things just because the, you know the tool said so and that was one thing that. That's uh, fair. What what I don't like and then honestly there was one case weeks later. One case, somebody asked me, hey, Andre, I need to do so much fluoride. Is that right? I said, well, you know, sh show me your, show me your, your, post your stuff or send me your link or your assessment tool. And then he showed me his fluoride and the fluoride was zero. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, well, that, that no, no, no thing in this planet can have zero fluoride. That is not possible. So, and go back to ATI, ask if that reading is correct. So he did and they found out, oops, you know, oops. You know, what is perfect? The fluoride wasn't zero. It was one point or 0 0.9 or something. Yeah. So, if he would have done this copy and paste, mm. his fluoride level would have been exceeded the healthy level of fluoride in his tank after the correction. Yeah. So, it it stuff yeah. happens. Yeah. And that's, that's as, fair. If the more familiar these guys are with their, with their, with their levels, they're kind of getting an idea of what is good, what is bad, and what is suspicious. That, that's the key, right? Well, I, I think you need to have a few ICP tests under your belt to kind of get a feel for what's yeah, yeah, normal yeah. or where stuff should be. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, another thing is, it's what's nice, you don't have to do water changes. Mm -hmm. So some people complain, ah, but it's another 50 bucks per month for the test. I say, well, you, you, you save the money on your, on, your, on, your, on your salt, right? And unless you, um, you don't really need to do a water change, give it a try. Or you can at least reduce your water changes and you will, you will save on salt. Yep. And uh, on, on RODI water and DI cartridges and, and, and the whole chain, right? Yeah, that's also fair. And you have more stability. Yep. Because every time, every time, whatever your salt goes back to this ratio of carbonate, bicarbonates, whatever your salt mix is going to be, your salt water is, it will never, even if you adjust your alkalinity level to the same, mm -hmm. it's not going to be quick enough converted in the same ratio uh, so that you're going to have definitely a different ratio that goes in your tank. Might not harm, right? But sometimes you, people, you, see, you see it by yourself when you put in new fresh salt water, you're going to see some of your corals going to retract the polyps, you know, some of the LPS shrivel up, mm -hmm. things like this. So there's definitely something going on uh, what they react to. Right? Yep. Well, that's one thing I didn't consider as much. That This being said, I haven't dose dose in ages but the carbonate versus the bicarbonate like i'm fairly certain i used to do a bit of a blend but it's been so long that i almost don't remember anymore but yeah it's this yeah. that balance yeah yeah it's it's the it's the yeah they call it the carbonate carbonate bicarbonate ratio as part of a natural seawater buffer system uh try to google that you may find some scientific articles my experience is the real good stuff you have to pay for yep. to that really tells you what's going on and the worst case there are a couple of books on the carbon cycle mm -hmm. really oh, some of them by, by Cambridge University they're hard to read because they talk in, in formulas right yep. so they're kind of giving you a booklet full of formulas and you 
you completely don't understand anything what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. However, we're also talking about the, you know, the, the natural seawater buffer system, and that's what you what what you want to learn of. Yeah. And it tells you, for example, what the in reefer language what the soda ash uh, baking soda ratio is in natural seawater. And you kind of, if you do these things, you can replicate it with your own mix at home uh, to make your own uh, balanced alkalinity solution if you, you want to say that mm-hmm. that is yes. a, at least less harmful or less you know, reactive than just soda ash or just baking soda mm-hmm. nope that makes sense yep all little things to consider but makes a happy tank yeah, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> it is it is all right andre it's been almost three hours i don't want to keep you all night but it's been okay. a good one it's been a good yeah. chat though i appreciate you coming on tonight yeah, thank you for the invitation, and uh, yeah, that helps me as well to get get stuff done on my end, uh, being well, a, exposed to public here, you know. Yep. You're, you're ready for making your own videos now, it looks great over yeah, there. It's, that's, that's the goal. Yep. <laughs> um, so if anyone wants to learn more, the link reefmoonshiners.com and the how-to guide is in the description of this video. So be sure to yeah. check it out if you want to dig deeper. Uh, definitely yeah. recommend reading the guide for sure. Um, and the tool is super useful. So definitely read through that. You will learn a lot regardless of what you decide to do. Definitely worth a read. Good place to start. Awesome. All awesome. right. Thanks David, so much, Andre. Thank and well, see you next time. That sounds good. I will see you next time. Okay, All right. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody who tuned in tonight. Hopefully you enjoyed it.